everyone. Thank you for joining me and the entire Google Cloud team today. And a special welcome for what's next for security professionals. My name is Sunil Pody, and I'm the VP and General Manager for Google Cloud Security. As many of you know, organizations large and small are realizing that digital transformation and the changing threat landscape requires a ground up security transformation. Attackers' tactics, techniques, and procedures have evolved as their targets have shifted and their desired outcomes have changed. So long gone are the days of a limited number of malicious nation state actors only targeting specific governments or critical infrastructure. These days, new normal is persistent attacks and off-the-shelf attack tooling leveraged by sophisticated threat actor gangs and nation states. And these folks are primarily focused on financial gain and business disruption across the mainstream enterprise, from the mid-market credit union bank to a very large enterprise in the Fortune 500. And to tell us more directly from the front lines, I would like to welcome Sandra Joyce, Mandian's EVP of Intelligence and Government Affairs. And it's my great honor to introduce her and the entire Mandian family into Google uh, since the recent acquisition. Sandra? Thank you, Sunil, and greetings to our audience at Google Next. As a new member of Google Cloud family, Mandiant brings expertise in threat intelligence and consulting to double down on Google's commitment to security. At Mandiant Threat Intelligence, we're always vigilant, tracking threat actors across the cyber domain as they seek to spy, steal, and sabotage the networks of organizations around the world. While cyber attacks used to play out completely behind closed doors, the threat has changed. And we're seeing an enormous amount of activity in full public view. State and criminal adversaries aren't just quietly hacking victims. They're creating public spectacles, which are designed to undermine the credibility of institutions and companies. Despite rumors to the contrary, ransomware is not dead. Those actors are still going strong, but the nature of their activity is always changing. Criminals simply need to find some way, any way, to compel victims to pay. These actors know they're undermining the businesses they target and they will not just stop at leaks. We've seen these criminals reach out to partners or customers or even to the media to garner interest in the leak and create public pressure for the victim. Unfortunately, many businesses find themselves in the impossible position of having to make a decision about preserving their data and, or acquiescing to threat actors. Nation state actors are playing a very similar game. A recent major attack on Albania included network disruption and leaked information similar to what you might see in many criminal cases. These governments are taking a page out of the cyber criminal playbook. But not all cyber activities are as straightforward. Information operations seek to target the hearts and minds of their audience, and threat actors use the cyber domain to carry out these types of campaigns. The information operations we see are designed to attack institutions like governments, alliances, or even democracy itself. We're now even seeing these nation states use information operations to target competing companies. For instance, an information operations we call Dragon Bridge has been posing on social media as residents living near a mineral processing facility. These fabricated online personas complain about the facility in order to stop competition of their country's activities. They use influence operations to bolster their country's market share while attacking competitors with influence operations. There are a lot of things driving threat actors to their targets. Some victims are targets of opportunity that are compromised by actors. Our supply chain has already proven to be an effective means of gaining access to downstream victims, and aggregated access has been abused by both criminals and nation states to great effect. APT29 is targeting technology companies to gain access to their customers. In Ukraine, broad access has been abused to great effect in a destructive attack. What kind of big data might interest an adversary? Data that might be used to track people, for instance. We've seen threat actors compromise hospitality, airlines, and other travel resources to track people of interest. APT39, one threat actor that we track, has a history of targeting people directly with spear phishing attempts, but they also target organizations with data on their victims, a potentially more fruitful and efficient means of doing business. Another threat actor, APT42, targets dissidents, activists, journalists, and academics who are critical of that country's activities. It is our mission to ensure that these activities are called out 
and provide defenders the tools and intelligence that they need to detect, block, prioritize, and respond to threats. Mannion and Google Cloud share a strong commitment to security and will work together to keep our customers, defenders, and the entire global community safe. Back to you, Sunil. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sandra. I'm so excited that you and the Mandian team, alongside the Threat Intel team, are joining Google Cloud. Now, as many of you know, Mandian clearly shares our mission to reinvent how enterprises detect and respond to threats and incidents. Mandian's products, services, and expertise will all combine to enhance our Google Cloud security portfolio and amplify our joint mission to keep customers safe. Now, here at Google Cloud, we continue to champion invisible security to help you move from today's reality, where security is bolted on as an afterthought, to a future where cloud security is engineered in, operations are simplified, and shared responsibility evolves to a model of shared fate, where the cloud provider has true skin in the game. Now, you might be asking why invisible security now? As you heard from Sandra, mitigating advanced and persistent threats can be difficult for enterprises if they don't have the resources, the talent, or the security engineering capabilities of a Google or a handful of other cutting edge organizations is ultimately what keeps some of these uh, you know, actors at bay. So that begets the question, are these mainstream enterprises, can they ever be protected unless they can be like Google? And imagine if enterprises of all sizes could re-platform on the same cloud, use the same tools, and use the same best practices that protect Google. That's essentially what we're doing with Google Cloud. And so first, we are helping enterprises become Google by providing the industry's most trusted cloud. And at the same time, knowing that most enterprises will take a, a while before they fully adopt cloud, we are bringing the best of Google to enterprises with security solutions for your on-prem, private, or multi-cloud environments. And we are helping organizations address these top-of-mind security initiatives across a variety of dimensions, starting with cloud governance and digital sovereignty. Now, as most of you know, digital sovereignty has become top of mind for many of you internationally. Governance and sovereignty are global issues with regulations and many unique compliance requirements across a wide set of regions. So the core of Google's and Google Cloud's approach is putting our sovereign controls in your hands. So this goes above and beyond data location and protection from external access. It includes predefined residency controls as well as assured workloads. And as most of you know, we have been focused on strengthening our sovereign cloud with trusted partnerships. And in addition to T-Systems for Germany, we have now embarked on deep and strategic alliances with Thales for France, Telecom Italia for Italy, and when for Spain, and with many more to come. So now while sovereignty is key, managing and understanding cloud posture and risk is essential to a wholesome experience in cloud. Now we help teams understand their Google Cloud security posture and risk profile by incorporating world-class innovations, starting with Forsady, a recent groundbreaking technology and an acquisition into Security Command Center. With this new addition, you can now fully understand your attack posture. You can prioritize, contextualize vulnerability findings. And, but that's not all, because you can now step ahead. And with Forsyte built into SCC, it allows us to provide advanced attack path simulations so you can apply targeted actions before attackers can take advantage of high-risk vulnerabilities. So in addition to governance and cloud risk management on GCP, Another area that needs to be reimagined by the CISO and the entire security team is security all operations all up across all your environments, cloud and on-premise. And on this journey, instead of having siloed SIM and SOAR and Threat Intel solutions, our new Google Cloud security operations solution converges security operations capabilities so that security teams can now pivot faster and manage alerts more effectively between Chronicle, SIM, SOAR, and our best-in-class Threat Intel. And with the addition of Mandian's leading in incident response services, in-depth threat intelligence gained from the front lines, and Mandian's advantage platform, all of these will collectively help us accelerate your security operations transformation. This combined approach will help organizations move from not just modernizing security operations to 
a state of proactive cyber defense, which ultimately we believe is the future of security operations. And now to tell us more about how leading organizations are transforming security, it's my great pleasure to welcome my friend and a great partner and a customer, Bashar from Schwab. Over to you, Bashar. Thank you, Sunil. Transforming security for me is all about how security can be a business enabler while making sure that team embraces change and leverages all the latest cloud native security controls available to us. To transform our security program, we are really focused on three key areas. Security transformation to support business growth, zero trust by default, and threat detection and response going cloud native. Now let's dig a little bit deeper on securing our cloud transformation. For my team and I, our what isn't really changing. In other words, we aren't taking more risk just because we are embracing the cloud. And our risk appetite has largely stayed the same. But what has changed is the how. Now, what does that mean to us? It means that just because we used to do things a certain way, mostly in legacy data centers, doesn't mean we should do them the same way in the cloud. Yes, we need to stay true to our risk appetite, but we also need to use this as an opportunity to innovate, to champion, and embrace change, to do things differently, if and where it makes sense. To use the power of hyperscale cloud infrastructure, cloud native controls, and AI and machine learning to achieve greater automation, I want to use machines to reduce my team's toil and enable faster decision making based on data sets we weren't even able to analyze previously due to scale and various constraints. Now, as I mentioned, our second key focus area is all about embracing zero trust architecture at scale. For us, that means putting identity at the center of all decisions and removing implicit trust relationships. We focus instead on establishing an explicit trust for each transaction. Contacts and visibility are the other dimensions that are crucial to a successful implementation of zero trust, in my opinion. So how do we make sure we have visibility and contacts from as many sources and signals as possible to dynamically and continually assess access policies on the fly? How do we make sure that works where our teams are, where these days is not likely in the office. Ultimately, zero trust is all about linking identity and access to prevention strategy. But realistically, it dovetails into our third key focus area, which is rethinking threat, incident detection, and response. For me, scalable visibility is the foundation to modernizing threat detection and response, especially in a world where our data sources continue to grow exponentially. The only way to process all of that security into contextual data and actually make it useful is to embrace cloud native technologies to ensure scale and speed. Scale is super important to us. It ultimately enables us to use advanced analytics to make better and faster decisions. There's also the harsh reality of security talent availability in our industry today. My belief is that we need to leverage machines to do more, to help us see more, and to make decisions on our behalf where it makes sense. That being said, people and expertise will continue to be important, even if they are outside of your direct organization. That's why choosing the right security partner is key, especially in the context of security transformation. Make sure you choose partners based on a shared vision of the outcomes you want to achieve together. The last thing I want to leave you with is that make sure your team doesn't get hung up on previous security patterns. Push them to embrace change and innovate using all the latest tools at your disposal. And with that, Sunil, thank you for having me and back to you. Thanks, Bashar. Bringing the best zero trust access for users to apps and apps to apps is top of mind for many of you. So if you've made significant investments in our Beyond Corp lands, alongside strategic partners such as Palo Alto and a variety of other partners in the ecosystem. This now gives you comprehensive zero trust options to secure private and SaaS app access while mitigating internet threats across managed or unmanaged devices. However, 
successfully adopting a zero trust security architecture isn't always easy. So to help, we have packaged our proven experience and best practices with our cybersecurity action team and select partners. With this, we are, they are available to support anything from exploratory zero trust conversations to architecture reviews to implementation support. So now we know implicit trust that we've covered so far can create you know, an opportunity for insider threat management and other significant security risks, not only in the context of access, but also the software supply chain. In my mind, that's the last green space of potential opportunity to, to be really reimagined within an enterprise security posture. And to further help enterprises secure software supply chains, we're introducing an all new offering called Software Delivery Shield. Software Delivery Shield takes this complex challenge with a tested approach based on best practices that we use internally and to secure our own software supply chains for 100,000 plus developers here. And so to double click on a specific area, we have made significant progress on assured open source software. Very excited to announce the preview for assured open source that now provides access to the same open source software packages that Google depends on, allowing you to benefit directly from Google's own in-depth end-to-end OSS best practices. So in addition to everything I just covered, we are also releasing a wide variety of innovations across our entire security portfolio. To hear more about them or to learn from others, join our breakout sessions to go deeper into the topics as well as engage forward looking beyond Cloud Next. Now we are so excited to help you become like Google with our most trusted cloud and by bringing security magic to you wherever you are as our two fundamental pillars of cloud security here at Google. And one thing I wanted to highlight was that in this journey of modernizing security, either on GCP or wherever you are, unlike some of our peers, we are chosen to actually offer best-in-class partner capabilities in conjunction with first-party Google solutions in a cohesive experience versus an all-or-nothing capability. So in closing, you may recognize that the pace of innovation on this path to invisible security has not slowed down. In fact, if anything, it has continued to accelerate, especially with Mandiant now in the mix. So I hope you'll join us and our partners on this journey as we reinvent security to meet the requirements of tomorrow. Thanks again, stay secure, and have a great rest of next. Hi, I'm Shaquille O'Neal, and I'm the founder of Big Chicken. So you gotta do that at the end when you say Big Chicken. Big Chicken is Shaquille O'Neal's emerging fast casual restaurant chain that focuses on big fun, big flavor, and big food. When you're trying to build a national chain, communication is so critical. To do that, you need a great partner. And we're really lucky that partner is Google Workspace. You know, Josh, every time he does a presentation, he just loves Google Slides. As the person responsible for our marketing, probably the best at Google Slides. His presentations is like I'm at a movie sometime. I'm just sitting there going. I've got some great new chicken sandwiches for you to try. Brand new recipes. <laughs> Isn't there something important we're supposed to be talking about? Good recipe development comes with collaboration. Using docs in Google Workspace gives us the tools we need to collaborate together. Shaquille's life gets crazy busy, as does our entire board. When you want to talk to me, make sure you put on my Google Calendar. Google Calendar is my girlfriend. I don't know anything I'm doing unless I talk to my woman. Google Workspace, productivity and collaboration tools for all the ways you work.
everyone. I'm Akshay Datar, and I'm a product manager working on security at Google Cloud. I'm really excited to be here today to tell you how you can leverage new GCP security products to bolster your security posture and lean more towards prevention. Joining me today are Shivam Dalal and Tate Regi from Goldman Sachs, one of our largest customers, to share how they think about prevention and how they use various GCP defense and depth controls to meet their security goals. In GCP, we take prevention seriously. We offer several complementary controls, such as IAM Grant, VPC SC, Org Policy, Tags, Policy Intelligence, as well as new offerings, such as IAM Deny, that all applied together effectively guardrail access authorization and resource configuration. To further harden security, we have been working on some exciting new features that I would love to highlight. Let's consider a use case to better illustrate these. Meet Taylor, an organization administrator who's looking to introduce preventive security guardrails in their organization. Specifically, they want to harden security for GKE containers. But due to recent increases in cost, as well as unauthorized container creations, Taylor wants to introduce access guardrails to limit access to who can create containers and to control costs. I am Deny can help you do just that. Grant policies typically allow access, with access denied by default. However, with an I am Deny policy, uh, which we recently introduced, Taylor can explicitly deny access that overrides any grants. In this case, Taylor can set up an I am Deny policy to block everyone except a limited set of GKE users from having the ability to invoke the create cluster method, create container method for GKE cluster resource types. This ensures least privilege and gives Taylor the ability to put some controls in place to help with cost management. Now, to truly enable preventive security, Taylor also wants to implement governance guardrails. Specifically, they want to make sure developers only deploy trusted workload for containers and serverless. This is where org policy comes in. Org policy allows you to set guardrails to enforce which resource configurations are allowed or denied. An org policy does this through the entire lifecycle of a resource, from configuration design control, resource deployment, after checking policies, through resource violation and drift detection. Now, there are essentially two types of org policies that GCP offers. First, GCP offers around 80 built-in predefined policies that we have identified based on industry best practices as well as red team findings. And we have already codified these so they are ready to go. Second, we are excited to announce the preview availability of custom org policies. With custom org policies, customers can now author and manage constraints tailored to their specific needs. This reduces the time needed to enact policy and constraint changes down to just minutes and hours. Now, let's get back to the use case. Taylor is considering, in order to ensure trusted workloads are deployed, developers must only use verified images in their deployment processes. In this case, unfortunately, we do not have a built-in GCP policy that Taylor can readily apply. Uh, so they look through GCP and GKE documentation, and the good news is that there is a mechanism called binary authorization that can ensure only trusted container images are deployed on GKE or CloudRun. Great. Now, custom org policy can help bring this guardrail to life. With custom org policy, Taylor can now author a custom guardrail for GKE cluster resource type for the create and update method using common expression language uh, based conditions to deny creation or update of clusters that do not have authorization enforced. Once authored, these, cluster, these guardrails behave like any other GCP policy and can be enforced using the console, gcloud, or existing CI CD pipelines. Now that a guardrail is designed, Taylor also needs to make sure that they can safely roll it out without disrupting operations. They can do this with an exciting new capability that allows Taylor to put this custom guardrail in, a, in dry run or audit only mode. By setting the policy in dry run mode, Taylor can study the behavior in production without actually putting production workloads at risk. Audit logs are generated, which help them understand what resource actions would be denied or allowed in contrast to live production behavior. Now, once Taylor has observed dry run behavior for some period of time, and they are confident that this new policy will not break workflows, 
they can progressively enforce this policy using tags. Selected tag nodes can be switched from dry run to production while leaving the rest of your resource hierarchy in dry run mode. Okay, now this policy is enforced. It's, 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 an, it's in action. Taylor would also like to keep track of resources that are going out of compliance. They can do this through the newly available violation reporting capabilities for custom auth policies in SCC. Resource violations against, against custom policies are published to Security Command Center periodically using detectors on existing assets. Now, in addition to violations, Taylor would also like to understand where all this policy is enforced in the resource hierarchy. This is especially important for compliance and auditing purposes. And another feature that we're introducing called Policy Analyzer can give Taylor a clear understanding of what policies are applied where and what resources are impacted by that policy. With these capabilities, Taylor can ensure defense and depth across the entire life cycle of, uh, of the resource. In addition, we have several enhancements coming soon. This includes preview of violations that allows you to understand the impact on existing resources before you enforce new policies, newly authored policies, as well as authority delegation, which delegates certain policy decisions to project and folder owners. With that, I'm happy to turn this over to Tate Regi from Goldman Sachs to share their approach to prevention. Goldman Sachs has been an incredible partner working together to build our roadmap for security uh, and, uh, and the vision for security. Great, thanks Akshay. We agree that it's been a great partnership. Our account team, as well as the product teams that we've worked with over at Google have been instrumental in our GCP journey. My name is Tate Raggy, and I'm a member of the cloud enablement team at Goldman Sachs. So for those not familiar, Goldman Sachs is a major global financial institution that provides a broad range of financial services to a wide variety of clients. Technology is an integral part of our business and it provides the innovative engine that keeps our transactions moving. Within Goldman Sachs, the role of our team, Cloud Enablement, is to empower engineers in our various lines of business to use the public cloud both securely and effectively. So to give a sense of the scale of the GCP environment that we're working with, we have over 200 different GCP projects now across several of our lines of business. We also have around 200,000 Docker images and over 10,000 compute VMs running in our GCP environment today. So with the particular focus on security in the public cloud, we try to adhere to the principle of defense in depth. So this means that we have several layers of countermeasures that cover different areas of risks that we face. In this session, we'll focus on a few of the many different general categories of controls that we focus on when we're looking at security in the cloud. So including network controls, IAM, and data protection controls. So we wanted to highlight some of the GCP native tools that serve to fill these layers in our security posture. So the first layer that we have is VPC service controls and a dedicated interconnect to secure our network. So this means that all of our traffic from on-premises is not traveling over the open internet. Through VPC SC, we're able to maintain a perimeter for our organization and we can restrict access to certain projects and resources, to all of our projects and resources, to Goldman Sachs IP addresses only. The next layer down is organization policies. So our organization policies are applied to any infrastructure that's deployed within any of our GCP projects in our organization. The next layer is gatekeeper policies. So rather than running on the entire re project resource hierarchy, these are a series of checks that run against our infrastructure as code files. So if a user has misconfigured a resource, these policies will prevent it from even being deployed in the first place. And the final layer that we have is IAM policies. So these control the level of access that users have to specific resources. So we have custom roles that grant a basic set of read-only and read-write permissions at the project level, and we grant these to any user that has the appropriate entitlements for that particular project. Beyond this, our application teams are able to further control access to particular resources based on their use case by provisioning additional IAM policies that are scoped to those resources. Now, let's use a real world example to illustrate how we use these different preventive security controls. So one of our major business use cases for GCP is migrating data from on-premises into BigQuery. So BigQuery is a solution that provides us with some great technical benefits. It's a relational database, has very strong consistency and up to five nines availability, and then has some big differentiating advantages, um, such as the fact that it's fully managed by Google, 
It has great scalability and is very cost effective for our use cases. So it makes a great technical fit for the enterprise data warehouse use case we have. In order to take advantage of these benefits though, we need to address some risks that are associated with migrating data into the cloud. So now I'll pass it over to my colleague Shivam to explore some of these risks and how we've handled them at Goldman Sachs. Thanks, Tate. Hello everyone, my name is Shivam Dalal and I'm also part of the cloud enablement team at Goldman Sachs. One of the biggest macro risks across the firm we have for migrating data to the cloud is data exfiltration. Data exfiltration is when an authorized person extracts data from the secured systems where it belongs and either shares it with unauthorized third parties or moves it to insecure systems. This can lead to serious consequences like financial and intellectual property loss, reputational damage, and legal issues. Now, let's identify some specific data exfiltration related risks and how we mitigate them using the security tools mentioned earlier. Following are some examples. Access to sensitive data using stolen long-term credentials, misconfiguration leading to unauthorized public access, access to public Google APIs, and granting IAM access to individuals outside GS domain. We'll now go over the risks in detail with examples. The first risk is usage of service account keys, which can be a security risk if not managed carefully. The main threats are credential leakage or privilege escalation by a malicious actor. In order to mitigate this, we enforce the two org policies which prevents developers from creating or uploading service account keys. Next risk we want to cover is misconfiguration leading to unauthorized public access. Let's imagine someone accidentally added the following IAM policy member to their project. This would open up the bucket to the entire world. We use the public access prevention or policy to prevent developers from creating storage buckets which are accessible by the public. Next is access to public APIs like Gmail, Google Drive, or APIs which are not supported by VPC service controls which could lead to data leakage. In order to mitigate this, we restrict the services usage by only allowing approved APIs which are thoroughly reviewed by our technology risk team. Finally, we have the risk of granting access to individuals not in the GS domain. Let's imagine someone added a member abc.xyz at company.com, which is not part of the GS domain. This could lead to data exposure outside of GS. To mitigate this, we use the IAM.allowed policy member domains or policy, which only allows identities from the allowed list of domains. We wanted to briefly highlight our current process for deploying org policies and how several of the new org policy features Akshay mentioned will help us. Our current process is to review new org policies and assemble a set of new policies to be released on a monthly basis. We then work with teams on testing and rolling them out. While organization policies covered several of our compliance requirements, we did need some org policies and features that weren't included in the default set of org policies. We've been able to partner with the GCP teams to request new features for org policies that have since been implemented. At Goldman Sachs, we view our preventive security posture as a living thing. We are able to continuously update our guardrails as we use new GCP services and as we have internal and industry-wide security findings. Using the suite of tools we've highlighted, we are able to do this largely independently and parallel to the development that our business teams are doing. These tools have also improved the productivity of our engineers. Our team has been able to save development time by using security features and policies that are available out of the box on GCP. Furthermore, developers on our business teams can rely on our defaults and guardrails and focus on security concerns specific to their apps rather than general risks of the public cloud. Now, I will hand it back to Akshay to close this out. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Shivam and Tate, for sharing your approach to prevention and for the great partnership with GCP in defining the future of preventive security. 
Thank you everyone for joining us today. All of a sudden, the entire world is connected and with it, the opportunity for hacking. So this was a group that we had been following and that we knew was a threat. The attacker's after something, and you want to find out what they're after. Remove their power, contain them, and then put them out. We want to change the battlefield. Our mission is to protect the safety of all the data we manage for all of the billions of users and customers of Google Cloud, whether it's health, energy, transport, finance, public sector organizations. We make sure that we, we defend and protect that every day, keep it secure, keep it private. I'm Phil Venables. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer for Google Cloud. When we think about defending the cloud, it's very much the same as defending all of the rest of Google. We have various different groups inside Google overall that are working together to protect our customers. Threat analysis group tracks attackers, analyzing threat actors that are developing techniques against us. There's many other teams that build defensive systems, build software, manage the firewalls, all these other tasks. Our job is to really understand what the threats are, provide that ground truth that allows us to really focus the security efforts of the wider team. When you understand your attacker's motivation, how their techniques are evolving, you can feel comfortable that your defenses are evolving to meet that and stay ahead of that. Then we have detection and response every single day monitoring our entire environment, looking for signs of attacks. Our focus is on gathering the information we need to put the story together. Is there an attacker here? And if there is, then we activate our response team. We like to think they're like a digital immune system. The more you can get information about what's going on, we'll be better defended. Every day, every hour of the day, 100% dedicated. Just all about how we try and stay ahead of that threat. Red team, it's really important to aggressively test ourselves. So we, we have some of the world's best attackers that are working for us. How would they go about attacking things? With every exercise that we run, the, the number of things that an attacker can do becomes less and less. We all look at the output of those exercises and determine if there are things that we can build into the cloud products so that they can get defended from the lessons learned. And then we also spend a lot of time working with external researchers, the so-called bug hunters. If they find an issue with any of our products, they can notify us of that. We fix that. In order to prevent errors, you have to study them. Bug hunters play an important role in looking for bugs from all kinds of different perspectives, which is really, really valuable. If you're coming from the outside, you might notice something that somebody who's on the inside might have actually not noticed. If that vulnerability is discovered, despite the best efforts of, of all of our organizations, you want that discovered by somebody that's going to tell you. Then we have Project Zero, active vulnerability research, looking at where vulnerabilities exist, not just in Google products, but in other products as well. We don't really care if you're, you know, working on another platform. Your security is important enough to us that we're going to invest in that. We have to think about securing the cloud overall, not just Google Cloud. We're giving away our hard-earned experience. We'd rather do that because it defends everybody. More and more organizations are moving to the cloud. Our job is to deeply partner with our customers and their IT and their security teams to help them secure things in the right way, to get their businesses operating, their mission satisfied, without having to worry about the detail of the technology and how to defend it.
everyone. I'm Bryce Buffalo, and I'm a product manager here at Google Cloud, focusing on assured workloads. And I'm David Williams, Cloud Manager for IMO and Insight, where I lead the DevOps and DevSecOps teams. Thanks for having me. Hey. Welcome to our session, everyone, where we're going to make compliance fun. Let's do this. Let's do it. In this session, we will focus on four key areas. First, the state of compliance, where we'll take an in-depth look at its importance, difficulties, and trade-offs in present day. Second, the innovation that Assured Workloads has brought to this area and the fact that this area has remained largely unchanged for years. Then I'll hand it over to David and we'll walk through Iron Mountain's journey to achieving their FedRAMP ATO and the impact of compliance on their business. And finally, Google Cloud's plans for enabling global compliance. As we think about the state of compliance, we need to remember that as global industries evolve, and new threats emerged that compliance has struggled to keep pace historically. In the last two years, the pandemic recently caused risk postures to change at an accelerated rate to protect organizations, which put additional strain on compliance frameworks, requiring revisions, exceptions, and additional controls at a historical pace. With all of this change coming to a traditionally slow innovating area, we need to take a moment and think about why compliance has such a high importance across enterprises. At its core, compliance represents the requirements and best practices for protecting the organization and its sensitive information. This could, be not, this could not be more critical in the current threat landscape we see today. It provides a baseline for security controls an enterprise needs to gain the trust of its customers. Spanning across ethical behavior, physical and technical controls, processes, and attestations all impacting the reputation of the enterprise organization. In the last five years, we have seen regulatory compliance increase across the globe in response to political policy changes and innovation, including cloud and high-performance computing. Customers across different industries leveraging these technologies and operating in these geographic areas have felt the pain of trying to adapt their existing controls or adopt new controls in response to threats or regulatory changes. These changes add complexity when working with regulators, putting additional strain and risk on the enterprise organization. The options these enterprises have been left with are to keep these applications and sensitive data on premises and miss out on the benefits of cloud in order to reduce the risk to the organization or move these workloads to a GovCloud where innovation, capacity, and support is limited in comparison to the commercial cloud offering. Today, enterprises have to, take, have to make trade-offs when supporting regulated data. They must compromise on GovCloud location and machine availability, along with accepting technology two to three generations behind creating toil and additional costs for operations and development teams. Some enterprises turn to self-hosted solutions, which are not equal to cloud, and lack access to AI, machine learning, adaptability, and robust security controls. These solutions put heavy burden on customers to operate hardware and software that is not their own. But there is hope. We saw the struggle and we heard it from our enterprise customers that these trade-offs were not what they wanted. So we decided to create a better way and Assured Workloads was born. We focus the product on the concept of shared fate. What this means is that Google Cloud understands that our customers' businesses and Google Clouds go hand in hand. We want to ensure customers that regardless of where the responsibility line is drawn, they are not on their own. Our mission is to shift more and more of the customer responsibility left while being there every step of the way to help the customer understand and manage the compliance, privacy, security, and reliability risk of their cloud investment. We exercise shared fate through assured workloads by applying our mission statement to everything we do. Confidently secure and configure sensitive workloads to support your compliance requirements in the cloud, choose the security settings, and we'll put the necessary cloud controls in place. A simple, easy to use cloud-based experience focused on reducing compliance toil. The core controls to enable a compliance are data residency for at rest, in use, and in process, data access controls 
restricting support access to adjudicated individuals, key management provided cri providing cryptographic controls for customers on or outside of the cloud, access control and access transparency, giving customers auditability of the cloud of the or and control of access when Google admins are fulfilling customer initiated support requests, and finally resource res resource restrictions preventing developers from using non-compliant products and services. Customers are able to configure assured workloads to support their compliance requirements in just a few clicks. Set your access requirements first. Select the restricted location of your data. Finally, you configure your keys, and this can be external key management, customer managed encryption keys, or Google Magic keys. All of this is then put in place for you in just a few clicks, allowing you to meet your regulatory compliance needs. I'm really excited to announce the general availability of Assured Workloads monitoring today. And I wanna take a second and thank you, David, for taking the time to bring tons of customer input and feedback over the last year to make today possible. And I wanna thank you for being a true partner and listening to the needs that we have and then acting on them and delivering. And we're gonna keep delivering. Thanks. This is one of the many products and features we will be introducing into the Assured Workload Suite. This new monitoring service allows enterprise organizations to see their compliance posture in real time, giving enterprises an overall view of the various guardrails in place and their current state, while allowing adaptability of configurations to meet the unique requirements the organization has. Assured Workloads monitoring provides an organizational view of Assured Workloads folders, detecting resource changes against the enterprise's desired compliance state for each folder. Meaning, if there is a change that occurs and an administrator is notified and provided with an overview of the control at risk, details of the violation, logs, and remediation steps. This is a tremendous step in making compliance easier on Google Cloud for enterprises. Now I'll hand it over to David to discuss how Assured Workloads helped Iron Mountain reduce the complexities of compliance and grow their business. David? Thanks. First off, what is Insight? Iron Mountain Insight is a content services platform that provides business insights and predictive analytics through machine learning. We use ML-based classification of a company's physical and digital information. Once this data is ingested and indexed, it can then be searched for patterns or trends, as well as used to run visualization and analytics tools against business use cases. When we first began this journey, we knew right away that getting our FetRamp ATO was going to be key to our future successes. Security is one of the core things that Iron Mountain is known for. So we embarked on a roughly 12 month process, working through the ISO, SOC, and NIST controls, and with each step getting us closer and closer to our ultimate goal of FedRAMP status. Partnering with Google allowed us to scale faster and tackle the complex requirements needed to achieve FedRAMP status. Through the shared responsibility and shared fate model, we are able to inherit some compliance and security controls and focus on others while Google takes care of the heavy lifting. This allows us to confidently move the business forward into the federal space while simultaneously increasing the overall security posture of our entire platform in every vertical in the US. Assured workloads in a nutshell allowed us to use our same code base across the entire GCP platform, the same ML APIs, the same scalability, but with the knowledge that our customers who require a more stringent set of controls are now covered. Data residency is a huge concern for us, and this allowed us to define the environment variables, restricting to a specific region, and knowing for certain that the data is where it should be. No rooms for mistakes in the deployment file or some manually created resource where everything is locked down with the short workloads. Another issue we have is with encryption keys and who controls them. A short workload gives us default encryption in transit and at rest, as well as a nice robust set of tools to manage our own and our customers' encryption keys. All of these things combined, plus access to support engineers in the correct geographic locations, give us and our customers peace of mind, as well as help us achieve our ATO in record time. Now, Bryce, how can we get these same tools and functionalities in other regions that we service? Well, the answer is as soon as possible. But 
in reality, we are launching in Europe already today. And that's also part of our plan is to launch in the APAC and also Canada over the next year. So we're doing this in response to the things that we've heard from you. Thank you. So while working with Iron Mountain and other customers to support FedRAMP compliance, we heard that exact question. What about the rest of the world? In response to this, we launched assured workloads into the EU, as I mentioned before. And not only that, we're also launching our sovereignty requirements, which you'll hear a lot about during other sessions during next. Like also with our APAC in Canadian, reg Canadian regions in preview today, we'll be pushing those forward over the next year to get to a general availability status to support the compliance needs that you have. Here's an example of how enterprises are able to support this global compliance use case in a single Google Cloud organization. Using the Assured Workloads API, enterprises are able to create folders with specific controls to support their selected compliance type. This creates a regulated boundary in which resources and data are labeled with the compliance type restricting access, locations, and enabling automated data classification for customers. Data, for cla data classification is crucial because it allows customers to do something they have not been able to do in the past is understand where their regulated data lives within the platform or within their environment. The flexibility of this design enables enterprises to architect regulated environments inside of existing Google Cloud organizations and easily migrate workloads, as David has mentioned before. Compliance can enable your organizations to grow its business across the globe. We see a short workloads as a way for us to get to a point where entering a regulated market is a business decision instead of a complex decision with uncertainty and headaches along the way. We trust that Google's shared fate model will continue to benefit Iron Mountain by simplifying more and more of the compliance responsibilities, allowing us to meet our customers' needs globally. Assured Workloads is available for customers to use today. You can check it out at cloud.google.com slash Assured Workloads or the Assured Workloads YouTube series for more detailed information on how to get started. I just wanna say thank you, David, for taking the time today to come in and talk to our customers about Assured Workloads and also sharing your FedRAMP journey for Iron Mountain. I just wanna say thank you for everything that you've done to help us along this journey, and I look forward to what comes next. Cool. All right, thank you, everyone. Bye, everybody. This isn't just about some impact at the corporate level. This is really about having an impact at a personal level. For myself, I identify as an engineer. I really want to be able to come into my company, Spotify, and figure out how to have an impact beyond recycling, biking to work, all those sorts of things. They're great, but when you can have an impact that goes global, the path to impact is as important as the destination. Okay, guys, may I just ask, could everyone please have their phones in silent and aeroplane mode? You may not know that uh, Spotify is in fact a Swedish-based company, and in Sweden, sustainability is really part of the cultural consciousness. For Spotify, we have decided that we want to contribute positively to climate change. We started with the exponential roadmaps goal, which is to get to zero carbon emissions by 2050. Our goal is actually to get to zero emissions by 2030. In 2021, we released our Global Equity and Impact Report, and in that, we outline our path towards net zero for greenhouse gas emissions. One of the things that is part of that playbook that I love the best is our annual Hack Week. So Hack Week is when the entire company comes together to figure out how to innovate across the company. So this year, we set the theme of Hack Week to making the planet cooler. One of the first and most basic things is, of course, we have moved everything to the cloud. With Google, we have the opportunity to leverage uh, a number of products that help us in our technology approach to climate change. And we do uh, auto scaling with uh, products like Bigtable, like GKE. There's a few things that are really at the core of our strategy. One, we wanna have a direct reduction of our own greenhouse gas emissions. The cloud part of the emissions was only a small part of the equation. It starts not just from the the cloud, but it goes all the way out to our end user devices. The second part is to take a look at the emissions caused by all the things that are upstream from us that we use. Not only will we reduce our own emissions, but we'll have a side effect 
to all the other companies who are using these same providers. And then the third part is really to leverage our unique position to be able to influence people's behaviors outside of Spotify. In particular, uh, not surprisingly, since I lead a group of developers and engineers, to really be able to impact the environment as well. Hi, Tyson. Hi, Max. Uh, Max, before we get started, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about how you got into engineering. I think it's a very fascinating way of trying to understand and structure the world. How did you get started with engineering? <laughs> I got started with engineering as a, a young man. Uh, my dad was actually a software engineer. My dad was also, or is, a, is an engineer uh, as well. So maybe that's a common pattern that you choose from your parents. I'd love to hear what sustainability means to you personally. Yeah, I am personally worried about where we are. I just felt my anxiety increase with regards to climate change. And um, I realized that by taking small personal steps, that that kind of milders my anxiety. So we recently had our hack week and the theme was making the planet cooler. You participated in that, but this was actually the genesis of the Climate Engineering Handbook. Just in a nutshell, can you define what the Climate Engineering Handbook really is? Today it has two parts. So it starts with a theoretical part that discusses where our emissions primarily stem from, device, CDN, networking, and cloud. So we discuss these chapters and, and from a theoretical perspective try to show where the emissions come from in each of these separate steps. And then um, there is a second part of the handbook, which is a much more hands-on guide uh, discussing what tangible steps you can take um, in each of these disciplines. In this overall process, really a sort of a bottoms-up process to democratize access and then action, tell us a little bit about how you think this will evolve over time. Amazing to see how many people at Spotify actually care deeply about this topic. I think the only thing that's limiting us right now is just people hearing about it. Well, thanks, Max, for being a climate champion uh, for Spotify and hopefully for the world. Thank you. How are you doing? Great. First, can you tell us a little bit about what you do here at Spotify? So here at Spotify, I lead business development for Backstage, focusing on driving strategic partnerships and other opportunities that improve the adopter experience. So what is Backstage? Yeah, Backstage is an open platform for building developer portals. It was built internally at Spotify, open sourced in 2020, and we donated it to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And what's a developer portal? A developer portal is a single plane of glass for your entire infrastructure. So it unifies your tooling, your services, docs, and apps under a unified, consistent UI. So we have these different plugins that they work with Backstage. There was a plugin that came out. Can you tell us a little bit more about what it does? So Cloud Carbon Footprint is actually an open source tool developed by ThoughtWorks. It leverages cloud APIs to provide visualizations of estimated carbon emissions on usage across Google Cloud, AWS, and Azure. We want to empower not just Spotify internally, but the broader developer community to be able to immediately measure, understand, and reduce their carbon footprint. Do you think that this has opened the floodgate for more possibilities? There's so much more to come. We believe that climate change isn't going to come from a single silver bullet to solve the problem. Instead, it's going to come from people who are united to make a lot of changes. Engineers, at quite a personal level, they want to have a big impact. It's not just about what we can do to reduce our company's global greenhouse emissions, but what we can do to help everybody else have that same impact.
Welcome. Today we have a super interesting topic to discuss. How to enable organizations to unlock their sensitive data for purposes of secure collaboration. Hi, it's me, Rene Kolga, product manager on the confidential computing team here at Google Cloud. Later on, we'll also have Brendan Taylor, CTO of Monetago, join us here as well. So what's our agenda? We'll start off with uh, the intro introduction of our confidential computing portfolio, then on to the main topic, launch of the confidential space that enables secure data sharing and collaboration. We'll have a quick demo, and then one of our great customers, Monetago, will share the use case for confidential space. But before I get started, let me ask you an unusual question. Would you be comfortable sharing your salary with your colleagues or classmates? Would you be comfortable putting your salary on a piece of paper right now and giving it to one of your colleagues and then asking her to do the same for you? Probably not, right? But today we'll show you how you as well as your organization be able to do it in a secure manner using the confidential space solution. So let's get started. What is confidential computing anyway? Well, it completes the end-to-end -end data protection story. Google always provided automatic encryption for data at rest. We also enable data in transit encryption capabilities. But what about data in use? Prior to confidential computing, there wasn't really a way to protect data and AI models while they're being used. So confidential computing strengthens the data protection story through hardware-powered encryption of memory. Confidential computing provides mitigations from hypervisor vulnerabilities, rogue admins, user space attacks, and various memory attacks. How does it work? If we look at the typical cloud compute setup, logical isolation is provided for VMs out of the box. With confidential computing, in addition to that logical isolation, we add strong cryptographic isolation and integrity capabilities, all provided by the CPU. Here you can see a secure processor that creates ephemeral keys for each VM. Those keys are rotated at every VM boot, and they are non-extractable from hardware. Even Google doesn't have access to those keys. It's also important to note three things about our implementation of confidential computing here at Google Cloud. First, it's ease of use. It literally takes a single button to enable confidential VMs. No need to rewrite code or recompile it. Anything that runs on a regular VM should run on a confidential VM. Next one is performance our customers typically see near zero performance impact when they enable confidential computing. Obviously, your mileage may vary as it highly depends on your workload. And last but not least, scalability. Today, we support instances for up to 224 vCPUs and almost a terabyte of memory, 896 gig to be precise. Our confidential computing portfolio today includes confidential VMs, confidential containers through our GKE offering, secure data processing through confidential data proc, and many future confidential solutions are in the pipeline. So what are the benefits of confidential computing? Obviously, confidential computing is not a silver bullet. However, it provides you with another security lever for your cloud deployments, especially for organizations with highly sensitive data. It completes the end-to-end -end data encryption story. It helps demonstrate due diligence for compliance purposes. And finally, it enables very interesting integration, data sharing, and collaboration use cases. And this last point is exactly what I want to focus on next. Unfortunately, today, many organizations are having to pick between innovation and maintaining user privacy, or between improving disease detection and protecting their patients' healthcare records, or between improving customer service experience in retail 
and protecting financial and personally identifiable information of their clients. Obviously, organizations want and need both. And that's why we're introducing confidential space, a powerful way to enable secure multi-party collaboration with trust guarantees, all built on top of confidential computing. As public preview for confidential space will be available soon, I would love to tell you more about it. As I mentioned, confidential space allows multiple parties to collaborate without having to trust each other blindly. It enables scenarios where you can gain mutual value from aggregating confidential data together while retaining full control over it. This type of privacy-preserving analytics is exactly what confidential space can facilitate. Let's take a look at a few examples. Here we have a healthcare organization on the left that wants to improve their disease diagnostics model. And we have an AI company on the right side that focuses on developing such models. However, they don't have enough PHI data to train their model, while the healthcare organization may not have all the resources to develop such model. When both of these parties collaborate, they both win. With confidential space, the data owner, healthcare organization, can share their sensitive data with this trusted execution environment in the middle, or TE. But if and only if, it's running on top of confidential computing, keeping memory encrypted, and if and only if it's running the right, previously agreed upon workload. In the end, patients win, disease diagnosis and detection improves, and no PHI data is put at risk. In another example, we could have multiple banks focused on fraud detection or money laundering activity detection. In this case, Workload author may be one of the collaborating banks or an independent third party. Again, all collaborating banks benefit because often this type of complex fraudulent activity is only visible when multiple financial institutions pool their data together. These were just a couple of examples, but we see confidential space use cases in insurance and fintech, for fraud detection in healthcare, for joint machine learning training, in retail and other verticals to build and enable data clean rooms. Now let's switch to a quick demo. Coming back to my question about sharing your salary with your colleagues or classmates. In this demo, we are going to show you how to do that securely using confidential space. Imagine two colleagues, on the left we have Alice, and on the right is her colleague Bob. They agreed on a code that would rank their salaries without revealing the actual numbers. Alice would generate an input file with her salary, just over 100000 and Bob will do the same on his side, on the right, with a salary of exactly 100000 Next, they will encrypt those files. Alice will do it first on the left. Here we'll also run a hex dump to show that the file is indeed encrypted. Bob encrypts his salary data as well. Then the encrypted files get uploaded to their corresponding storage buckets of our collaborators. In this example, Alice is the workload author. This could have been an independent party as well. Bob audits the workload prior to collaborating and is able to reproduce it on his side to ensure its legitimacy. Alice already built and uploaded the Docker container with the workload that will rank their salaries, but note show the actual numbers. You can see it's SHA-256 hash here. This is the same hash that Bob adds to the attribute conditions within his workload identity pool, which is the definition of his policy. It defines under which conditions Bob is okay releasing a key to his encrypted salary data. In this example, his policy checks for a number of things, including the type of the confidential computing technology required, like AMD SCV, version of the hardened OS where the workload container will be running, the authorized user, and the image, digest, or hash of the workload itself. Alice also has a similar policy, but as the workload author, she doesn't need to include the image digest. 
Instead, she includes the workload location in the artifact repository. In our demo, Bob also plays the operator or admin role and runs the workload that Alice built. However, that could have been an independent third party. Admins can only start, stop workloads, but they are unable to access data in clear text or influence the workload in any way. Well, the workload is now done and Bob will read the output. This output is of course accessible to all collaborators. Let's see what it says. Oh, snap. It looks like Alice is making more money. It's time for Bob to ask for a raise. Now let's imagine that Alice goes rogue and instead of just learning where she ranks among her colleagues, she wants to get their actual salaries. So she, as the creator of the workload, modifies the source code to include salaries in the output file. She then rebuilds the Docker container and pushes it to the repository. As a reminder, Bob's policy includes the hash of the workload under the attribute conditions right here. Now we'll get Bob to rerun the now modified workload and let's see what happens. Okay, the workload completed and Bob will read the output. Obviously, Alice could do the same as the output is in plain text and meant to be shared among all collaborators. As we can see from the new output file, we received an error stating the given credential is rejected by the attribute condition. It means that Alice wasn't able to take advantage of her colleague Bob because his policy included, among other things, the hash of the previously agreed workload. When Alice modified it, the hash obviously changed. That's why the workload didn't leak any sensitive data, such as the actual salary of our collaborators. This is how multiple parties can share sensitive data and collaborate in a secure manner. So, I hope you enjoyed the demo. In summary, confidential space provides an ability to collaborate without blind trust. Everything is measured and verified before you give access to your data providing you with data confidentiality, data integrity, as well as code integrity guarantees. You retain complete data ownership. You control how your data is used and which workloads are authorized to access it. And again, you don't even need to trust the operator or the admin. Now, I would like to pass it on to one of our great customers, Monetago, so they could share their confidential computing and confidential space use cases. Brendan, over to you. Thanks, Renee. Hey, everyone. Brendan Taylor here, CTO at Monetigo. Monetigo is a leader in financial services technology, providing the only global fraud prevention solution against duplicate financing. Our mission is to make working capital more accessible to the millions of underserved businesses by reducing risk in trade finance. Monetigo's secure financing product has been in production since 2018 and has recently been launched globally in partnership with the SWIFT network to make it available to all major banks around the world. Our problem is simple in nature, but complex to solve. Businesses get various forms of loans secured against receivables or inventory they own. The problem is that it's very easy for these businesses to go to more than one bank and get more than one loan against the same set of documents. This would be like you taking out multiple mortgages from different banks against your home. What this boils down to is that because banks have no effective way of sharing sensitive information between themselves, billions of dollars are lost each year to fraud. This is where we come into play. Our secure financing platform provides a way for banks to share this sensitive information without breaching their customers' privacy. Our product has two core pillars to it. Firstly, deduplication where we compare every document submitted to identify if it is suspiciously similar to another document already submitted. And second, authentication, which aims to identify whether the documents provided are actually genuine or not. So what makes this a difficult problem to solve? Well, it comes down to trust and privacy. Firstly, banks have to give us their customers commercially sensitive data, 
but also they have to trust that other banks will not be able to gain any insight into their business. So how do we provide guarantees as to the protection of this data and their privacy? Like all businesses that deal with regulated and sensitive data, we implement ISMS policies to address identified risks. But the root of trust for these operational policies ultimately relies on good behavior of employees. The truth is, insider threats through either negligent or malicious behavior represent the most significant source of security breaches at tech companies. What we need is a technological solution to minimize this risk. With Google's confidential computing offering, we took one step closer to our goal. Initially, Monetigo is leveraging confidential GKE to ensure protection of data whilst in process. However, since the data is stored with Monetigo, it must be equally protected at rest. While there is no easy way of implementing trustless data storage, we implement a multi-key encryption process to ensure no single individual can breach security. For phase two, the introduction of confidential spaces will enable us to take the next step by giving the option to our customers of storing their own sensitive data within their own secure accounts. The data kept client side can be pulled on demand into a permissioned confidential workload on Monetigo's accounts for advanced analysis, the results of which contain no sensitive data and can be shared back to the relevant parties. This creates a similar paradigm to client-side encryption for secure enclaves with verifiable privacy guarantees through attestation, meaning our customers can rest assured that their data can be safely processed by Monetigo with a greatly minimized risk of data breach, even from internal threats. The value that can be unlocked through the adoption of multi-party computation globally is profound, whether it's saving countless lives by being able to learn from pooled medical data or helping an entire industry eliminate systemic problems, such as fraud through collaborative learning in a competitive environment, we are excited to be a part of the evolution in this space and look forward to continuing with Google on this journey. Now, back to you, Renee. In closing, I would like to thank you for attending and leave you with a few key points. Confidential computing is an industry-wide effort in secure computing. And we at Google, together with OEMs, are working and innovating to further our privacy and security guarantees. Confidential computing provides hardware-based data encryption and remote attestation. It's easy to use, performant, and scalable. Finally, confidential space builds on top of confidential computing and enables new use cases like secure data sharing, privacy-preserving analytics, join ML training, and much, much more. I hope you try out our preview, and thank you very much for attending. Tecnologia é como se fosse um bichinho que uma vez que ela te morde, não sai mais de você. Eu cursei análise e desenvolvimento de sistemas, só que eu não consegui terminar. Tinha lá aqueles formulários, né? Qual que é o seu nome, seu endereço? Mas qual que é a sua profissão? Eu não tenho profissão. Agora é a hora de eu retomar. Aí foi onde eu vi a oportunidade do Bootcamp da SoCode Academy em parceria com o Google Cloud. E seis meses depois, aí foi onde eu recebi o convite para poder fazer parte do time da SoCode Academy. Só que do lado de lá. Ali o mundo, sabe quando o mundo ganha cor? Então, nessa hora, ficou colorido. Eu, Patrícia, mulher casada, mãe de três filhos, 39 anos, profissão, engenheira de dados habilitada em Google Cloud Platform.
Welcome to Next, and welcome to the security track at Next. My name is Nimi Reichenberg. I head security operations product marketing here at Google Cloud Security. And in today's session, we're going to take a look at one company's journey to transform their security operations with Google Cloud and Chronicle. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce our co-speaker, Mike Oroz, Chief Information Security Officer at Vertiv Corporation. Thank you, Nimi. I'm really glad to be here and walk you through our journey. Excellent. So to get us started, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about Vertiv Corporation. Absolutely. Vertiv is a company that supplies critical infrastructure to most of the Fortune 1000. We're located in approximately 100 countries, and we have almost 24,000 employees worldwide. Excellent. And I believe one of one of the claims to favor of Vertiv is you guys um, invented the first data center cooling system? That's absolutely right, Nimi. A, a company which started out as Liebert Corporation back in 1965 built that first cooling center AC unit, and that's what was the spearhead for starting Vertiv. Uh, well, data centers sure have come a long way since. They sure have, absolutely. <laughs> Excellent. So before we zoom in right on security operations, maybe tell us a little bit about the, you know, the entire security function at Vertiv, what are you in charge of? How is that structured? Yeah, absolutely. I lead many functions that comprise security. It includes identity access management, security operations, security architecture, and product security. Excellent. And maybe talk a little bit about the size of the team, where they're located, you know, the breadth of the, of the team. Sure. Our, our team is located in every geographic region. We have teams in Asia, Europe, as well as the U.S. and parts of Latin America. And uh, we're tasked with maintaining, monitoring all our systems to ensure every, everything is running as expected. We're providing assurance to our internal stakeholders and to our customers. Excellent. All right, so let's talk about security operations and talk about some of the challenges that I believe many of you that are watching the sessions are faced with. So I'd like you to um, you know, describe what the situation was like before when it comes to security operations. And we've kind of divided that into three main topics, maybe the first one being the trade-offs that so many people in security and security operations specifically have to deal with. So maybe talk a little about, you know, Data engines, cost, scale, trade-offs. What was that like for you, Edward? You're absolutely right. So trade-offs exist all the time in cybersecurity. It's all about money and speed. Frankly, no one wants to make those decisions, but a common trade-off is what exactly we're going to log, what we're going to monitor, what we can monitor based on what we bought. No one likes to be constrained in those ways. So in many senses, you almost have to kind of pick which blind spots you're, you're willing to live with, right? It, it can be that situation. No one wants to be in a position where they have to decide what they won't monitor just because they can't afford to procure the right system. Got it. And of course, with, with security increasingly becoming a data problem, I think you know, being able to make sure you can ingest and analyze as much data as possible is ultimately key to you know, being able to detect and investigate threats. You're absolutely right, Nimi. Now more than ever, data is prol proliferating. And proliferation of data means you have to analyze more information to get to the basic outcome of an investigation. And with that, you never want to be constrained by a platform that essentially uh, is so complex to operate that you can't get to the end of the investigation. You're always tweaking that platform to get it to work and, and give you the results you need. Great, so I think that's a great segue to the next point that, that we want to discuss, which is complexity, right? Not just, you know, cybersecurity is complex. Um, hopefully, you know, the tools that we use you know, should be as simple as possible, especially given how hard it is to find very skilled and experienced cybersecurity professionals these days. Talk about you know, complexity, how that affected you before you embarked on this journey. You're, that's that's right, Nimi. So uh, it's important to realize a lot of traditional SIM platforms, you have to learn all this complex language and scripting in order just to call data and get the results from your queries. And oftentimes, you have to write queries that might take many hours to execute. No one wants to be in a, a position where you have to sit around and spend most of your time learning how to operate a complex system instead of just picking it up conducting your search, getting results, dispositioning your investigation. All right, and I guess that every, you know, every minute or hour or day that you spend on dealing with that complexity is time that you're not actually spending on Doing protecting the organization, right? Yeah, so 
uh, you're spending time learning the platform. You can't just pivot if someone leaves the team and moves on to another role somewhere else. You, you actually have to have some downtime and train someone. And that right there takes away from security because you're not committing resources on task. You're spending time doing ancillary tasks like training, which is just superfluous towards your objective of securing an organization or your company. Right, and finally, maybe we can talk a little bit about speed. Uh, you know, speed is everything in cybersecurity. You know, it's not usually not about trying to prevent everything, but how quickly you can detect and respond to threats. So maybe talk about some of the challenges around speed that you encounter. That's right. Well, there's three core elements to any SIM. It's ingest, it's storage, and compute. You can't be constrained in any way, and compute is, is the key ingredient when it comes to executing fast queries and searches and getting results in a timely manner. There were times historically where I would wait until the next day until they get the results of a query. And that's when you're in a crisis situation or a situation where you need to really focus and get results so you can understand what exactly happened. You can't wait that long. It's, it's, not, it's not something you can do. Excellent. So um, obviously, you know, a lot of challenges, a lot of pain, which I think caused you to go out and embark on this journey to better security operations. So maybe you can share, you know, kind of what are some of the things that you were looking to change, you know, how you evaluated different solutions, and you know, what were kind of, the, again, the kind of the criteria that you were looking for to start embarking on a, this journey and get to a better state? Well, anyone who goes and buys any security tool will automatically go out and have to compare and contrast across all the solutions on the market. It's the right thing to do is do your due diligence and your homework. And what, a few of the things that we couldn't live with, with or without, we didn't want to make trade-offs. We didn't want to sacrifice uh, you know, the how much we logged and how much data we had to access when conducting an investigation. We didn't want to trade off ease of operations and the fact that we wanted to commit, you know, more people on task of conducting security work and doing security work versus actually uh, being trained on how to use a, a complex tool. That's very different. And we wanted to improve speed. We want to ensure that when we need to investigate something, we don't have to wait around for a couple days to go by just to get to that moment where we can close an investigation. Right, and, and I think with, with, with yeah. trade-offs, what I hear is not only about how much data you can invest and how much compute power you can harness to analyze it, but it's also retention, right? Talk maybe about the importance of retention and going right. back and, and looking back at threats that you know may have been discovered now, but have been around for six, nine months. I think Log4j is a great example of that, so maybe Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, you're, you're right. You know, you can't just because something made it in the news and it became public, like a security threat, it doesn't mean that that threat hasn't existed for a period of time. And I don't know where I heard the statistic, but it, many incidents and breaches, the attacker has been in your network for many months. And what that means is you need to have more than just a couple months data to investigate when you conduct your investigation. Honestly, I want a year. I want a year highly available. I want a year of data where I can just push a button and I can get results. I want to be able to do it myself. I, I want it to be so that any member of my team can pick up this tool and actually get results just as fast as I can do it myself. And I set the bar pretty low for myself, so. <laughs> Excellent, so maybe tell us a little bit about kind of you know, the, the selection process, you know, the bake-up process before we move into kind of what life looks like after you've made a selection and sure. you know, embarked on this journey. So the key elements that I wanted when we selected this product was I wanted a year retention, highly available. I want unlimited compute resources and we want ease of use where it's no harder to search something on the internet like in a typical search engine, I want it to be the same ease of use for the SIM platform. I'd probably add, you probably want all of that without breaking the bank, I would That's assume. right, I want it all for a low monthly fee. <laughs> Which is, you know, probably as, as a, you know, probably even more important in, in this economic yes. climate as, as it's, you know, it's been in a while, so. That's right. Excellent, so. Um, let's move on to the current situation. So we talked about, you know, three big goals for this journey. Avoid the trade-offs, simplify and ease operations, and do everything faster and become more agile. Uh, let's talk about the trade-offs. Maybe you know, share with with us, with the audience, where you are today in terms of you know 
how how much data were you able to ingest? You know, um, um, how much? How long do you retain it for? Where are you now? With, with I believe it's been eighteen months since you 18 started. Eighteen months. You're yeah. absolutely right. right. So. Uh, when it comes to onboarding with Google and Chronicle, it was a very impressive feat which we accomplished. We were previously logging uh, a certain amount and we were constrained by our historical platform. And in other roles, I've been constrained the exact same way where we had to pick and choose what we wanted to log. We went in a period of three months from zero logs ingested into Chronicle to over 20 different data sets. And that's amazing. And some of these data sets are very prolific from a logging perspective. We're talking endpoint detection and response software. It's very noisy. That alone in most traditional SIMs might use up all your allocated ingest capability. So that was really great. And we went from day one being able to conduct simple queries, get results immediately. We don't have to wait around for the results to take hours or days to come back to us. So that's something we've increased. We've increased the mean time to detect uh, and decreased our response times. Uh, we, we're now logging and ingesting over 2,200% more than we did in, in the past. That's pretty mind-boggling. You're going to also see here, you're handling three times, since you're ingesting more data, seeing more things, you're handling three times more security events with the same resources? With the same resources. So we actually have zero people that are tasked with maintaining and keeping Chronicle alive, which with most traditional SIMs, you would have to have at least one or two staff members that just work on maintaining the infrastructure, patching it, ensuring it's current. No, it's all hosted in and updated automatically by Google. So we went from maintaining the platform to now focusing on security work. Excellent, I think that's a great segue into you know, that goal of easing operations. So zero full-time administrators for, for, for Chronicle SIM, which again, I think is just un unbelievable. Shocking. Yeah, but also maybe talk about the ease of use. How, how did you find the ease of use um, of Chronicle? And especially since, you know, getting security experts so hard to find, did that impact how you're able to bring in team members in any way? That's right. Now we have the luxury of bringing in people and training them how to use our SIM. And that pretty much offers the opportunity for many people in other IT roles or people who are new out of school who want to break into cybersecurity and security operations. They can essentially pick up the tool. And if they're familiar with using Google, the Chrome, or any search engine, they can essentially just take uh, a certain element of information like an email address or an IP address and enter that into the search window and then hit execute and boom, you've got results right away. Yeah, I think what, you know, when I hear this from, from customers and, and people who are used to kind of you know, legacy and traditional sims, to hear them say, hey, if you know how to run a Google search, you can get value out of, out of Chronicle. I think that, that again- But you mean I don't have to write a Python script to actually get results? Yeah. That's, you know- and, and to your point that you set the bar very low for yourself, I believe that you yourself even from time to time oh, yeah. go into the system and, and, and conduct investigations. To tell us a little bit about that. It, well, that's great. You know, I mean, I don't have to harass people and bug people just to do work when I can just go in and do it myself. So if I know a task only takes a few minutes to, to conduct or, or execute within Chronicle, I'll just grab something and I'll, I'll search for it myself. I'll figure out what's going on. Then I'll go back and forth with my team and I'll validate it. So it really gets everyone focused more on the action end of security. So easy, even a CISO could use it, right? So How's easy, that? even a CISO <laughs> could use it, you're right. Excellent. Um, and, and on the last point, let's talk about agility, right? You want everything to happen faster, if it's from queries to response, uh, again, share, maybe share some of the results. Again, 18 months into, into your journey, can you share some of the you know, agility improvements with us? Yeah, exactly. So not only are we processing more security events, we now have the ability to build trends and do trend analysis to determine how we can optimize systems and use the data from our SIM to reduce security operations investigation times. And that's really important when you're trying to you know, uh, process all that data. So our teams are now processing approximately three times the amount of events they were doing previously. And that has really uh, helped us scale and scaling is what you want to do without increasing your costs, and that's what we've accomplished so far. 
So 2,200% more data analyzed, 3x the events, 50% faster with no additional resources. That's right. Unbelievable. Okay, so you've made a lot of improvements, obviously, over the last 18 months. Uh, but, you know, the work uh, in general and specifically in cybersecurity is never done. Maybe kind of as, you know, final thoughts, share with us a little bit of kind of what's next. What are your plans, um, not just for Chronicle specifically, but for the security operations function, let's say, over the next 12, 18 months? That's it. So over the next 12 to 18 months, our objective is to optimize operations. It's to take what we have now, the basis of a solid security operations function, and we want to enhance and optimize the queries that we run all the time. Our alerting capability, we want to optimize it. We want to eliminate false positives. We want to scale the team more than before. And we want to you know, embed Chronicle in all of our incident response processes, which is something that everyone should be looking to do. Just to optimize and gain the most value as possible out of the SIM platform. That's terrific. Mike, thank you so much for sharing your journey with us and thank you everybody for watching. One of the things that we announced at Next is Chronicle Security Operations, which is really our integrated suite of products and capabilities to help you invest, detect, investigate, and respond to threats with the speed, the scale, and the intelligence of Google. If you want to find out more information about Chronicle Security Operations, please visit chronicle.security. You'll have everything up there. And with that, I want to thank you again. I hope you enjoy uh, the rest of next and the rest of the day. Bye-bye. I ask one of our analysts, what's the longest running search you've ever had on this platform? And it was minutes, you know, which was life-changing for us because our prior approaches, you know, that answer would have been weeks. There's no management of infrastructure, nor do I have to go and ask for favors from IT to uh, get their help in managing infrastructure. It's a turnkey solution that uh, you know, keeps the security team focused on security work, not on infrastructure management work. This allows us to keep all of that EDR data going back 18 months. Uh, you know, so we get a really rich set of data uh, to do searches on and to do historical analysis against. Uh, so that's been a really big win for us. Royal Caribbean National, the brand is about being the most innovative and the boldest. And when you come on the ships, you can feel it. You feel the energy and the passion. Given the state of consumers, the state of the world today, we needed an agile solution, an agile marketing stack. And one thing we knew is we wanted to leverage Google's data cloud across the suite of products. The biggest benefit since we partnered with Google Cloud has been the increase we've seen in our site conversion and our direct-to-consumer business. We definitely see working with Google as a cornerstone to us moving forward. It really unlocked a lot of data that we could then use to build models, that we could use to build better segmentation and smarter marketing. The investments we made with Google Cloud are now driving the world's largest cruise lines return to service. We didn't just do it in one market. We did it in ports around the globe. And we did it with Google at the center of that. Hi, I'm Shaquille O'Neal, and I'm the founder of Big Chicken. When you're trying to build a national chain, communication is so critical. To do that, you need a great partner. And we're really lucky that partner is Google Workspace. Google Calendar is my girlfriend. I don't know anything I'm doing unless I talk to my woman. Google Workspace, productivity and collaboration tools for all the ways you work.
everyone. This is Sri, and I am so thrilled to be moderating this all women cybersecurity panel today and to introduce these two power women, Nicole and Sonal. Sonal, let's start with you today. In addition to being the uh, team lead for GCP SecOps at Uber, tell us a little bit more about yourself. Hey, everybody. I'm thrilled to be here today. I am a firm believer in continuously learning, trying out new things, and having a growth mindset, basically saying, I don't know something yet. To that end, I started learning classical piano three years ago, having never played an instrument before. And I'm so proud to say I'm able to play Chopin Waltz. And it's an easier pieces, but still it's a huge achievement for me. Um, so to say anything is possible. Um, with that, I'm very excited to be here today with fellow panelist Nicole, who leads Cloud Platform at Target. Nicole, can you take a moment to introduce yourself, please? Hi, I'm Nicole, and as Sonal said, I lead Cloud Platform at Target. Um, outside of that, I am currently in a 200-hour yoga teacher training. I'm really trying to focus on mindfulness and being present in the moment and taking space for myself and being selfish with my time so I can really look inwardly and figure out what I need to do to better myself from not just the physicality of yoga, but the mindfulness and the spiritualness as well. Shri, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself outside of Google? So first and foremost, you both are amazing women. Um, I can't play the piano to save my life. And I do yoga, I also do meditation. Uh, so with you on that, Nicole. And um, I'm just thinking and trying to do the calculation in my brain. I do maybe like about half hour, three days a week of yoga. And if I had to do 200 hours of teacher training, that might be like four, four years, I think. Um, so. Anyway, um, Nicole, let's start with you this time. Uh, Target seems to be at the bleeding edge of container security, and you're working on um, a lot of things around runtime container security versus just build time container security, which is what a lot of our customers are still grappling with. Can you tell us a little bit more about your journey and how you got here? Yeah, so for Target, we started in Google Cloud about six years ago. Um, we migrated from another cloud provider and we deployed into a wholly GCE environment. So it was a flat project. And um, looking at that, we needed to have a way to validate um, our builds all the way through to runtime. And so what we came up with was the concept of pipeline integrity. And what we did was we were able to track and trace a hash from build, deploy, throughout the entire pipeline into runtime and read in those hashes to confirm that they match throughout the entire pipeline. And we would take these hashes and do a match on deploy. And if there was a build mismatch or if the hash just got corrupted for some reason, we would prevent that from being able to be deployed in our environment. And we do run these checks frequently to ensure that there is no deviations from those individual builds. Um, we'll also look at um, timestamps for these workloads in our environment. And if an image is around for longer than 90 days, we will ask teams to redeploy proactively um, to pull in security updates, to pull in platform updates, to ensure that the components that are running within the workload are as up to date as possible and meeting our individual security requirements for remediation, remediating of vulnerabilities or any sort of hygiene that we need to take care of. So that concept is what we're really trying to get moved forward into our GKE environment, which is our newer environment, a shared VPC environment that is much more mature than our single flat project, which we call our classic environment. And so we really want to take these um, different controls that we have in our lower environments and move them into our higher security environment. So things that need a little bit more stringent uh, security and compliance controls and really moving that needle further into the container realm from our VM implementation. And so we really want to take the containers and be able to further isolate and segment these individual workloads throughout their life cycle. That is wonderful. Uh, I am sure uh, there are teams at Target that are dedicated to selling bananas and socks. And 
I wonder how you get them motivated and engaged in the in in all the security work that you're doing. Yes, we definitely found that push for these findings, vulnerabilities, and requirements is a lot easier than pull. Having teams go out to a single dashboard on their own volition wasn't proving to be very conducive to getting teams to actually do these updates. So we were able to push these alerts to teams throughout their preferred communication method. So basically subscribing to the individual alerts themselves, whether that's Slack, email, or um, our alerting system. So we really wanted to meet the engineering and development teams where they work and not have them struggle to get where they needed to go. We also have the concept of a security score and those are tied into OKRs. So our team's doing their pen tests regularly. Are they remediating their vulnerabilities within the remediation timeframe? Are they engaging with security when they need to be? And so all of that um, aggregates into an individual score that is reported back up through leadership. And an added benefit from all of this, from pipeline integrity to the security score to implementing our security controls into our GKE environment, all give us a benefit from the tagging, the labeling, and the stamping so that we have a good inventory of our cloud-based workloads um, from component to attribution and ownership for the individual application teams as well. Nicole, it's very interesting you say that um, because at Uber, we also believe that we should let builders build and we want to know what is the cloud footprint and have adequate guardrails in place. Um, to that end, our um, leadership is fully engaged in communication with the partner teams. We have a shared responsibility model. Again, we try to have the dashboards and metrics and we emphasize on the severities of the vulnerabilities to fix we try to give um, relevant, accurate, and actionable information that can lead to better fix the vulnerabilities. Uh, and it has led to a lot of successful closure of vulnerabilities. Talking about container security, right now our emphasis is on image vulnerabilities. We have selected GCP container analysis as a product of choice. Uh, GCP container analysis gives us an uh, in-depth view about uh, the vulnerabilities that are occurring in an image, which package, which version, the CVSS scores. All this helps us put this information in a JIRA or a T3 ticket that the engineering team is comfortable with for them to action on. Yeah, so... Um... It's it's really interesting to hear about the dashboards, but also the credit score. Like that was amazing that you have like an OKR as well as a credit score for every team, uh, Nicole. So no, I know Uber has made tremendous progress with least privilege for all of your machine identities. It's a very tough problem. And you actually seem to have it all automated at this point of time. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you're doing there? Yeah, absolutely. So till date, we are able to reduce 5 million access permissions granted in our GCP environment. So to give you a little bit of background, uh, we do have an automated way to provision resources in GCP and the access permissions are strictly controlled. But we do have a lot of legacy GCP projects which had this problem of access permission. So we decided to use GCP IAM recommender and we built an application around it that is serverless, scalable and extensible and runs fully in GCP. So uh, to operationalize IAM Recommender, what we do is we create, uh, we get information from Recommender and create Jira and T3 tickets again for our engineering teams, giving all the information on how they can fix it. And we've had a lot of success with it. Um, the application is running in maintenance mode right now. Yeah, we, um, we've also been using um, Active Assist IAM Recommender and really working on paring down our service account uh, roles and permission grants. Um, as I mentioned, we have a very large classic uh, flat project um, that was started about six years ago when conditions and curated roles were not in existence. So we had the option of primitive roles, which was owner, editor, and viewer. And those were very, very high, highly privileged roles. Um, and that was not very conducive to locking down an environment for least privilege. Um, you could either have all or nothing. Um, and so looking at moving that environment into a more least, 
least privileged model, we've been using active assist um, policy intelligence suite. So looking at simulator and troubleshooter to ensure that as we're pulling these permissions back, we are not going to negatively impact the business. We have to be able to sell socks and bananas. Um, so looking to Google's uh, intelligence suite to really give us this rich data to create a mitigation plan basically. And descoping these permissions to a point where we feel confident in our environment. One of the things that we're kind of looking at now is our Terraform service accounts, which are instantiation accounts. We're creating new services, we're creating new environments, platforms, projects and folders. They need higher privilege. Um, so we kind of want to look at using conditions to create a model where these accounts are only getting the role grants when they need them. So looking at the factors that go into this, when are we going to be building projects? It's few and far between. So these accounts really shouldn't be having these highly privileged roles all the time. One of the other things we're looking at is lateral movement in our environment. While we may need some service accounts to cross that project or folder hierarchy boundary, we don't need all of our service accounts to be able to do that. And we want to ensure that it's only happening where it makes sense. So for VPC service controls, being able to read in a network from the host projects. And we really want to ensure that we are paring down the environment in a way that makes sense and that these lateral movement accounts are only occurring where it makes sense. And we really wanna work with the service to identify and remediate any unnecessary overlap across our hierarchy. Yeah, so it has been a great fun to geek out with both of you. And uh, I'm still kicking myself about being in this all woman panel. I'm curious, uh, Nicole, have you been in one? How does it feel to be here? And how does it feel to be a woman in this field? Yeah, so I have been in one all women panel before. Um, it was an infrastructure panel for Target and it was a lot of fun, but it was also super stressful. Forgot all my lines, it was <laughs> nerve wracking. Um, but I did feel a sense of community and everyone on the panel was also trying to help me get back up, messaging me behind the scenes, letting me know that it was okay. And that was something that I haven't really experienced on a panel before. And from a team perspective uh, at Target, at other companies I've worked at, I have been on teams where it's an all women team. I've been on a team where I am just the only woman. My current team, it's a pretty even split, but there are more women than men. And I've seen kind of the dichotomy that comes from these different structures. And one of the things that I look at as I'm thinking about being a woman in tech and a woman in security is how do I make sure that the next generation is afforded the same opportunities and services and um, privileges that I got? I want to be able to assist anyone to have the same experience that I did to get where I am today. And so it's really about sending the elevator back down and ensuring that I'm paying it forward. Um, Sonal, I am curious about your experience here as well. Yeah, and Nicole, agree with everything you said so far. It is really encouraging that there are leaders, women leaders like you around to help other people uh, who are coming behind you. I, for one, I try to focus on the problem to solve. Um, I don't approach it from a gender perspective. That being said, at Uber, we do have a diverse team and I can see how we hold each other accountable and we are growing and learning at the same time. I would also like to emphasize to anybody listening to this talk is to be a lifelong learner. Try out new skills. If you wanted to learn something, now is the right time. You know, get out of your comfort zone. Nothing grows there. Take risk. You might fail. But hey, you will learn, you will grow, you will get better. I cannot emphasize enough that you need to keep learning and need to keep investing in yourself continuously. So no, I just loved your growth mindset. Um, and I, I, I wanted to say at Google, we believe very strongly that diversity is important in our security teams. And one of the reasons that we feel that is our adversaries come from diverse backgrounds and they think in different ways. And if we don't reflect how they're thinking, we're not gonna be able to adequately secure Google as a company, as well as all the customers. Um, 
who rely on our software. And so one of the things that we recently did, uh, and there's a link to this in the session resources, we launched a blog called Security Voices, which celebrates all of the amazing stories of Googlers from different backgrounds who work on security in one way or the other. So I hope you will all check it out and give a shout out to all the amazing people and the stories featured there. And thank you again, Nicole and Sonal for being so generous with your time and your expertise. And it has been an amazing session. I've learned so much both from the prep and here, and it's been fun to geek out. It's been fun to talk about um, the, our, our different passions and like even weightlifting. And um, I, am, I am thrilled. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. What excites me about global air traffic is that we're connecting the world. Swiss is part of the Lufthansa Group and the National Airline of Switzerland, operating one of the youngest and most efficient fleets across Europe. Since our collaboration with Google Cloud, we elevate our passenger experience by improving our hub steering and avoiding misconnections. By this, we have an impact also on our sustainability by increasing the efficiency of our operations. With the Operations Decisions Support Suite, or OpsD as we call it, we want to make better decisions when it comes to optimizing our operations day by day. Google Cloud's professional service organization was really a game changer in the way we started the project. Since partnering with Google Cloud, we managed to achieve 1.5 million of Swiss francs of savings back in 2021. We are optimizing our tail oil location by always sending the most efficient aircraft on the respective route. Working in the airline industry, it's very important to also bear in mind our CO2 footprint. On one side, obviously we want to reduce it, but on the other side, we also want to link people and economies. Google Cloud helps us reducing our ecological footprint with the help of new technologies. This provides decision support for our ops controllers, taking smarter decisions, faster decisions. In a customer-centric business, it's obviously important that whatever we do, it has a positive impact on our customers. When it comes to performance, when we need to load data in milliseconds due to changing conditions, we use different tools across the Lufthansa Group. Some of the solutions that we're enjoying from Google Cloud is the BigQuery, Vertex AI, and the operations research capabilities. Together with the innovative technology of Google Cloud and the extensive know-how of how to operate airplanes at Swiss, we brought together the best of both worlds by optimizing our operations in the future. The future in our context looks pretty exciting because we are starting today and implementing our tools as Swiss and we are planning to roll out, of course, everything to our Lufthansa Group Airlines. And that makes us really proud. So the office CTO was pulled in while Etsy was considering a variety of different clouds and we worked with them to sort of talk about some of their advantages in machine learning and search as well as touching on our sustainability initiatives too. I think that type of partnership from the beginning made a huge difference in ultimately selecting Google as our cloud provider. While we definitely know we've reduced our energy consumption, what we're missing is the actual monitoring of energy. They've just kept coming back and listening to us and saying, what do you need and how do we partner with you to solve these problems? I'd say from the get-go, our relationship with Etsy has always been one of aligned values. They've been leading the industry in sustainability, not just in the retail space where they are, but actually across many dot-coms. What Google has done with their you know, cloud infrastructure is be very sophisticated and actually apply machine learning. By doing that, their PUE or power usage effectiveness is much better than a typical data center that we would rent space in. It does go beyond the environment. It involves education, it involves well-being of your employees, and well-being of your customers as well. Thank mm -hmm. you.
often to using cloud native tools to strengthen your platform security posture and manage risk. I'm Tim Wingerder, a product manager on Google Cloud Security Command Center. Later, I'll be joined by Maciek Zatorski, an engineering manager at Akado. For those joining for the first time, I'll do a quick recap of what Security Command Center, or SEC, is. Then I'll jump into what's new across the product. And finally, I'll spend time chatting with Maciek from Akado about how he and his organization are using Security Command Center. Let's dive right in. Security Command Center is Google Cloud's native security solution that federates security insights across your organization. You can think about it in four areas of value. First, asset and resource tracking. You might have asked yourself, if I don't know what I have deployed, how can I secure it? Cloud Asset Inventory helps customers gain visibility into their ever-expanding set of assets and resources to understand how much and of what they've got deployed, helping eliminate any security blind spots. Second, it helps discover vulnerabilities and detect potential misconfigurations of those cloud assets that might be putting your organization at risk. Users receive notifications about new or updated findings in near real time to drive action and reduce that risk. Third is threat detection. Spotting malicious activity and unauthorized behavior, Security Command Center can detect threats such as malware, crypto mining, brute force SSH, outgoing of denial of service attacks, anomalous IAM grants, and potential data exfiltration. It also can detect multiple types of container runtime attacks. Fourth, compliance standard mapping. Simply, Security Command Center helps customers maintain compliance. They can review reports to ensure resources meet requirements set forth by a variety of regulations and industry best practices, like the CIS benchmarks. It brings all of this together in one central tool across the customer's entire GCP environment throughout the security lifecycle. Now, let's talk about what's new across this functionality. First up, we've released several platform-wide updates that improve the experience across the entirety of Security Command Center. I'll quickly cover three here. First, since you rely on Security Command Center for critical security operations, we've made it easier to understand whether its ability to protect your estate is impaired. If Security Command Center detects that a finding publisher, like Security Health Analytics or Container Threat Detection, cannot produce findings or operate as expected, it will surface a special type of finding along with instructions for how to remediate so that you can benefit from all of its capabilities. Next, we've significantly improved the experience around consuming findings. We've standardized the information across the different finding types and reorganized the content so that they are easier to understand than ever. We've added a query builder that works together with those standardized attributes, allowing you to quickly scope your views to view just what you're interested in. And lastly, we've rolled out muting. This allows you to express simple or complex rules across your organization to suppress findings that fit a certain criteria, keeping you focused on the insights that are most directly relevant to your business. Next, we're making the findings that SEC already provides around your estate's assets, misconfigurations, vulnerabilities, and threats even more actionable with a contextualized, risk-oriented view. Without impacting your environment, Security Command Center will simulate attacks to try and reach your estate's high-value targets. The output of those simulations informs a value that is assigned to findings based on how they contribute to the overall exposure of your valuable assets. This information will help your team reason about the findings in Security Command Center and take action on the most impactful drivers of your organization's risk. This is coming to early access soon. Complementing everything I've mentioned so far are improvements in Cloud Asset Inventory and Security Command Center's posture management. First, Cloud Asset Inventory allows you to understand deeper details about your resources through asset relationships. For example, representing information about the App Engine application that a particular App Engine service is in. Analytical querying is also available in early access. This capability allows you to interrogate your cloud estate directly without having to export it to BigQuery first, helping you understand details about your current or past state easier than ever before. Assets in Cloud Asset Inventory are the foundation upon which SEC's early access custom posture detection are built. You can express your own detective controls and SEC takes care of the rest, producing findings in real time and helping you monitor your posture. And finally, we've launched rapid vulnerability detection in public preview. This zero configuration service automatically discovers network endpoints, open ports, and installed software packages and alerts you of vulnerabilities like weak credentials, incomplete software installation, and exposed admin interfaces. Security Command Center continues its innovation in the threat detection space and recently made virtual machine threat detection generally available. This unique agentless approach instruments the hypervisor to offer nearly universal and hard to tamper with threat detection. Additionally, 
SEC, and Chronicle have a tight integration that lets customers seamlessly pivot from a finding detail in Security Command Center's console into a curated alert view within Chronicle. From there, users can investigate the threat and quickly pivot to associated actions and events related to the finding. For a special deeper dive on each of these, check out my colleague Tim Peacock's Cloud Threat Detection Security Talk from early this summer. We've worked hard on these updates and are excited for you to check them out. Next, we're going to check in with Macek from Okado to hear about Okado's experience with SCC. Welcome, Macek. Uh, can you introduce yourself, please? Hi, Tim. <clears throat> I'm Macek Zatorski, uh, Engineering Manager at Okado Technology. So at Okado, we leverage cutting-edge technology and automation to transform online glossive retail. Our team of more than 2,500 technologists collaborate across 12 development centers globally to innovate and build our world-leading e-commerce fulfillment and logistics solution, which is called Okado Smart Platform. OSP enables our global retail partners to offer millions of customer unparalleled shopping experience. And after two decades of innovation, we are now a global technology company, providing software, robotics, and AI solutions for online grocery. Google Cloud Platform has been with us on that journey and played a significant role. And as we grow as an organization, our presence on GCP has also increased. So today, we are managing more than 3,000 GCP projects across various business streams, and we processing petabytes of data. On a daily basis, we have to deal with different types of users, each with a variety of needs, including data scientists, ML engineers, data analytics, product managers, as well as some, some external users. So as you can imagine, the scale and complexity comes with a number of challenges. And security is definitely one of them. And this is where my role and my team is to tackle these challenges. Amazing. Thank you for being here today. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about how getting started with Security Command Center was at Okado? Uh, maybe how long it took or how rolling it out went? Sure, I, I have to dive into a bit into history. And a few years back, we started with uh, self-hosted security scanners. Um, they've provided us with uh, really meaningful info, but we quickly discovered that they just wouldn't cope with the amount of assets we had. Scanning of those assets was taking longer and longer and would eventually lead to inertia in our security response, which just wasn't acceptable for us. Also, we had to manage these tools ourselves. Uh, that included some maintenance like uh, upgrading, patching, reconfiguring integrations. And that's an extra effort we had to take, which we obviously don't want to. We wanted to focus on resolving security problems. The tool was managed by us centrally, and it didn't allow for any work delegation. And we realized it is a problem because it creates bottlenecks in our security process. So this is where we started to evaluate alternatives and Security Command Center was one of them. First impressions, extremely positive. It served really well as a single pane of glass for our spectrum of security challenges. For example, we used uh, security health analytics for our config validation in BigQuery, GCS, and Cloud SQL resources. We had now reliable scans every 12 hours, which gave us much more confidence comparing to our previous solution. I have to say the whole setup and adoption was really, really smooth. Um, thanks to the GCP being a native GCP service. So for us, this is, there was something we knew. This is, uh, was just a matter of setting up the right permission, catching up with documents, and that's it. We, after a few days, were able to see our first insight into our security landscape. As you know, sometimes appetite comes with eating, and we were very eager to try on new few interesting thing, features we heard about. And that would include um, things like instant scanning, um, scanning with more comprehensive security control list, uh, permission delegation, which would solve our problem I've mentioned earlier, or even threat detection. We decided to upgrade to SCC Premium. That's great to hear. It, it sounds like you really benefited from a uh, cloud native solution there. Uh, you also mentioned a shift from centralized management to uh, delegation. Uh, could you tell us about that shift and how you manage the delegation of posture issues out to those business units? Sure. 
at Acado, we truly believe that autonomy drives innovation. And we always want our teams to be self-sufficient as much as possible. And we aim to empower them so that they can move at the right pace. And as with everything else, we just apply this principle to security. And using access control at the folder level, we are able to delegate SCC findings directly to relevant business units. This is how it works. If I grant SCC permission on a folder owned by a specific business unit, that unit will receive only findings for assets from that folder. They will not be able to see anything else, including notifications from other units. And this is not only great separation of duties, but also it allows owners to focus on issues related strictly to resources they know most about. We're really proud of our delegated views feature as well. Uh, did you use that at all to help uh, move some of your security operation tasks to developers? Yes, indeed. We actually built a whole pipeline of, of security findings. We've used continuous exports feature. We built on top of uh, PopSop and, uh, and Cloud Function. And that pipeline would automatically generate a Jira ticket, which is then assigned to developers. They are usually owners of, of a resource. So from now on, they are in charge. They can prioritize and resolve the problems at their own pace. And this is this is how we surface the autonomy of, of, of the teams. Awesome. Can, can you share a little bit about that process that they follow, how they're addressing vulnerabilities or threats uh, and remediate them in your environment? Yeah, so going back to my to, to the team, uh, once they in control of a misconfiguration, um, in many, many cases, they, they can remediate the problem on their own. Uh, but of course, we don't leave them alone in this. First, the findings from SCC are quite rich. They, they really give um, enough context to, to be able to act. And the, um, the findings would also include very comprehensive recommendation uh, on, on the solution. Um, we also have security, central security teams, which they can always consult if the issue is more tricky. But in case of live security threats, we need to act slightly differently. And we need someone who will more proactively monitor our state. And here we have another integration, uh, this time with Splunk, which is our central CM system, where our security operations team oversees the whole organization. I actually have one recent example, um, famous log4j vulnerability, where our operations team was able to respond pretty much instantly to, to the live attacks they've seen. And I have to say, we were really impressed how quickly this new control for a completely new type of attack was added to SCC. That really gave us that confidence we, we were looking for, the confidence that we can not only leverage the tool, but also the security expertise from Google Cloud. I think we all remember Log4j. Uh, that's great to hear. Uh, could you share a little bit about how Security Command Center helps uh, demonstrate compliance standards within or to, to your stakeholders? Yeah, audit is always a big thing. And we, we recently ran an internal audit across the Okada technology. Again, SCC has been extremely helpful here. Uh, specifically in identifying projects with the most severe issues. We were able to correlate projects with business owners and generated a very useful report for our audit team. They were really grateful because it, it worked for them as, a, as an action list. Um, another example is our initiative to visualize our security estate. We created a security kit map which aggregates findings at the folder level which usually corresponds to a department or some kind of organization uh, division. And this visualization helps us to make data-driven decisions, prioritize things, or assign resources where they are needed. Great. Thanks again for sharing your experience. Uh, do you have any closing thoughts for other folks who might be considering Security Command Center for their needs? Yeah, uh, Security Command Center has proven itself for us, and uh, we are now very, very confident that going forward it can serve as our central security monitoring tool. So, highly recommend. Great. Thanks again for joining me today, Maciek. Thanks, Tim. To hear more about the topics I covered today, check out the videos from my colleagues in the Getting Started with Security Command Center playlist on YouTube 
or head over to our product documentation links to hear more about how Security Command Center can help with your security needs. Thanks for tuning in. All of a sudden, the entire world is connected, and with it, the opportunity for hacking. So this was a group that we had been following and that we knew was a threat. The attacker's after something, and you want to find out what they're after. Remove their power, contain them, and then put them out. We want to change the battlefield. Our mission is to protect the safety of all the data we manage for all of the billions of users and customers of Google Cloud, whether it's health, energy, transport, finance, public sector organizations. We make sure that we, we defend and protect that every day, keep it secure, keep it private. I'm Phil Venables. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer for Google Cloud. When we think about defending the cloud, it's very much the same as defending all of the rest of Google. We have various different groups inside Google overall that are working together to protect our customers. Threat analysis group tracks attackers, analyzing threat actors that are developing techniques against us. There's many other teams that build defensive systems, build software, manage the firewalls, all these other tasks. Our job is to really understand what the threats are, provide that ground truth that allows us to really focus the security efforts of the wider team. When you understand your attacker's motivation, how their techniques are evolving, you can feel comfortable that your defenses are evolving to meet that and stay ahead of that. Then we have detection and response every single day monitoring our entire environment, looking for signs of attacks. Our focus is on gathering the information we need to put the story together. Is there an attacker here? And if there is, then we activate our response team. We like to think they're like a digital immune system. The more you can get information about what's going on, we'll be better defended. Every day, every hour of the day, 100% dedicated. Just all about how we try and stay ahead of that threat. Red team, it's really important to aggressively test ourselves. So we, we have some of the world's best attackers that are working for us. How would they go about attacking things? With every exercise that we run, the, the number of things that an attacker can do becomes less and less. We all look at the output of those exercises and determine if there are things that we can build into the cloud products so that they can get defended from the lessons learned. And then we also spend a lot of time working with external researchers, the so-called bug hunters. If they find an issue with any of our products, they can notify us of that. We fix that. In order to prevent errors, you have to study them. Bug hunters play an important role in looking for bugs from all kinds of different perspectives, which is really, really valuable. If you're coming from the outside, you might notice something that somebody who's on the inside might have actually not noticed. If that vulnerability is discovered, despite the best efforts of, of all of our organizations, you want that discovered by somebody that's going to tell you. Then we have Project Zero, active vulnerability research, looking at where vulnerabilities exist, not just in Google products, but in other products as well. We don't really care if you're, you know, working on another platform. Your security is important enough to us that we're going to invest in that. We have to think about securing the cloud overall, not just Google Cloud. We're giving away our hard-earned experience. We'd rather do that because it defends everybody. more and more organizations are moving to the cloud. Our job is to deeply partner with our customers and their IT and their security teams to help them secure things in the right way, to get their businesses operating, their mission satisfied, without having to worry about the detail of the technology and how to defend it.
Hi, everybody. My name is Stephen Capehead. I'm a product manager at Google, and I focus on identity, specifically Workforce Identity Federation, which this presentation is about. And I'm um, luckily or thrilled to be joined by Alan from VMware today. Alan, how are you doing? Doing pretty good, Stephen. Happy to be here. And um, as Stephen just said, my name is Alan Gamboa. I'm currently a full stack engineer at VMware. Great, Alan. Thanks very much for joining me today. Uh, Alan's, uh, it's great to have Alan in terms of making this uh, real in terms of uh, customer actually leveraging the capability of this of this feature. So just in terms of what we'll be going to, um, as I mentioned, Workforce Identity Federation uh, is a new offering that extends uh, Google's existing cloud identity management capabilities. And it lets you use your, uh, your existing identity provider. And I say existing, potentially some third party, basically an external to Google identity provider and you want to utilize those user identities to authenticate and authorize access to Google resources. And that's what Workforce Identification does. So we'll be going through that, I'll give you an overview. And then I'll be handing over to Alan in terms of uh, detailing their specific scenario. And Alan's kind of also got a demo for us in terms of again showing this, this capability in action. So let's jump straight in in terms of this, uh, this product. So very simply in terms of you know, what, what is the current reality customers are experiencing today uh, when it comes to identity management? Uh, things are getting more complex. The security risk is getting bigger um, and they've got to consider what the user's experience is, making sure it's seamless, but still with adequate controls and making sure customers can get, users can get access to the things they need to get their jobs done. Um, so that onboarding and protecting users is obviously imperative. Um, seamless experience I mentioned. So it's things like single sign-on. Users don't want to have to remember multiple usernames and passwords. They want to be able to leverage, you know, that rich capability they have or the organization does in terms of multi-factor authentication and leverage that same identity in terms of accessing other systems. So single sign-on is, is imperative. There's privacy and regulatory considerations to consider. And then when I talk about that seamless or that management, again, just like users don't remember multiple username and passwords, the organization also wants to try and simplify the, the management of, of those RDP solutions. So especially when we start considering you know, multi-cloud environments now as well. So all of these considerations are, are key um, and this is, you know, these are the type of things that uh, Workforce Identity Federation delivers on. So let's explain how, how it does that. So very simply, uh, you can read it on the on the left there, but what we have with, with Workforce Identity Federation is an ability to quickly enable users leveraging those existing identity providers, user entities or, st or stores rather, and give them direct secure access to Google Cloud services and resources. Um, so the big point here is that you're not, you don't need to synchronize Workforce user identities. You know, consideration of privacy with cloud identity is, you know, we could obviously always federate, um, but the reality is you then have to synchronize those uh, Active Directory or Okta or Forge Rock, whatever it might be, you need to synchronize those identities into cloud identity. And that's again, as I mentioned, additional management overhead. So with this new capability, it is a synchronous, synchronous experience. Uh, very simply, the user will log in to the existing identity provider and they will get, get issued a token and that token is then passed through to Google and it is checked. Basically, there's attributes in that token, checking things like group membership, for example, or the user's name, whatever it might be, whatever you want to contain within that, within that token, and then conditional access is given based on those attributes. An example is something like a group. If you want to give access to uh, you know, permanent employees versus temporary employees, as long as that token stipulates uh, that that member or that user is a member of the respective group, then they're given or denied access. So it gives you that, uh, that granularity. And workforce identification um, is broad in terms of you know, the, the services that you can leverage or detailed on our product page, which I'll share at the end of the presentation, but very simply in terms of once they authenticate, and the, I'll show in a second, as I said, the, the architecture here, but they'll give an access, they can access via the cloud console, they can leverage uh, the SDK, or in other words, like the Google Cloud CLI, or an API, a BigQuery API, or uh, you know, GKE API, for example, whatever the service is that that user requires, uh, they can access it on interface via this, via this mechanism, as long as obviously it's one of the Google supported products that's uh, one of the products that supports Workforce Identity Federation. So when I think of why customers would want this, I detail some of the pains they're experiencing today, but in terms of there's four key things I've identified or that the team has identified at the moment uh, in terms of what we see um, Synchless, I've just detailed, is imperative in terms of making sure this isn't another identity store that has to be managed. Then in terms of if we look at control, anytime we look at identity and security, you know, fine-grained access control is imperative again. 
And it's through uh, attribute mapping and attribute conditions that we can enable that with Workforce Identity Federation. And then in terms of flexibility, this is uh, Workforce Identity Federation is um, currently supports uh, OpenID Connect standards. Uh, and therefore, sorry, people, it, it supports all the OpenID Connect or SAML2 uh, protocols. So therefore, any external IDP that supports those, those protocols can be leveraged with this, with this capability. And then in terms of looking at uh, from a sovereignty perspective, uh, you know, we've got to consider in terms of where data is stored. Um, identity is one of those considerations. So for organizations, if you look from an industry regulatory perspective or, or a country sovereignty perspective, you know, a capability like this will allow them to dictate where, that, where those entities are stored and therefore not within Google for this specific uh, example. So where that is applicable, that will be another advantage of leveraging a technology like this. And then in terms of, uh, I did mention just showing a more of a, an architecture diagram. So let's just look at the flow that would be followed here. So as I mentioned, the user, in this case, a developer, logs on to the existing uh, third-party IDP. They will then obviously authenticate whichever mechanisms or conditions have been dictated via that IDP. Once they are successfully authenticated, they get given a token. That token is sent through to Google via the security token service. And the security token service first does an evaluation. It refers to something called the workforce identity pool. And the workforce identity pool is the, is the basically the container of that configuration of relationship between the third party identity provider and workforce identity federation. So it contains the, 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 the conditions, uh, what attribute mappings there are, all those things I've detailed earlier in terms of the configuration map to IAM policies to allow or deny, uh, all of those got contained within the identity pool. So the SDS service will evaluate the specific request against that pool, see if it's valid, is a particular, particular attribute mapping, and if all that is uh, correct, it will then send back a token to that specific user, and that user will be redirected to the relevant service. In this case, as you can see, it's to the, the GCP console, and they'll then have the right permissions to access the relevant resources. Again, detail to specifically what that IAM policy allowed, not broadly, but obviously still giving you, as I mentioned, that fine grained access control. So obviously you can see the full flow here is very beneficial in terms of taking advantage of the, of the user's common experience of signing in, for example. So that's obviously beneficial. Now, one thing I don't think I did mention was that workforce identity, identity pool is configured, but available in a, in a specific project, but is available, a GCP project that is, but is available organizational wide. So a second project, third project, whatever it might be, is also able to leverage this identity pool for this authentication. But the reverse is you could also have multiple IDP configurations in one identity pool. So if you want to support you know, multiple you know, ping identity, forge rock, and all these uh, within that single pool to a, a wide spectrum of therefore users, but to the same resources, you could allow, you could configure it that way as well. So there's a lot of granularity in terms of what you could do here. Um, as I mentioned, Alan's on the call, he's already introduced himself. And uh, what I think is more beneficial is that you can see some of this stuff in action. So I've asked Alan to come today and present in terms of what the VMware scenario was. And then as I said, he's gonna follow that with a fantastic demo. So Alan, thanks again, and over to you. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, so over here at, at VMware, we have uh, thousands of employees and, uh, thousands, and hundreds of teams, all or many of them leveraging uh, cloud computing solutions across you know, all the providers, including GCP. Um, as you can imagine, uh, trying to manage all these different projects and accounts at scale can be quite a nightmare, especially from a security perspective. Uh, the last thing we want to do is have each individual employee create and, and, and manage an IAM user for themselves, right? So uh, in order to do this at scale, um, internally, we developed a product called CloudGate, uh, which, uh, which handles all of this, uh, all of this for, for our various employees. Given the prevalence of GCP uh, within our organization, we need a solution that uh, would allow us to do this at scale for GCP as well. So this is where um, you know workforce pools come in for the rescue, and I plan to demonstrate this with the following demo. And this is our, our product CloudGate, right, uh, which allows us to uh, you know manage access at scale without having to create IAM users, respond temporary credentials of of service accounts, right, uh, that are appropriately scoped with the right permissions. Right? So as an example, let me go to the our common organization and. Um, gain uh, temporary access to uh, one of the accounts here. Um, so I can get both uh, programmatic access at the appropriate level, right? Uh, as a member of 
my specific team that manages this product, I have up to admin, but others may only have, you know, read only for, for instance, right? Uh, when you click programmatic access, um, we can get uh, uh, these specific environment variables, which we can just paste into uh, the terminal. Right, as you can see, access key, secret access key, whatnot, and uh, from there we can uh, run commands. Uh, additionally, we can uh, also get uh, web access. Right. All right. So this is what we're trying to recreate with GCP. Uh, so GCP, uh, what they offer is workforce tools. To use the workforce tools, right? Yeah, a little bit of setup is required, right? Um, you have to define a billing project. Once you define a billing project, you can create a a uh, workforce pool by you know providing a, a workforce pool name uh, and the organization that that workforce pool is going to belong to, right? Um, and then once that's created, right, you can then uh, attach an identity provider to that workforce pool. Uh, and you have to give it some some information that's required. Uh, most uh, and most importantly, being the the uh, client ID, which you can actually get from the uh, identity token that um, your identity provider exposes. Uh, so it would be the auto claim here, for instance. And um, then, also very important, is this mapping of. Um, I think this is actually a better example here. This mapping of, uh, I guess, uh, claims or attributes in your token to uh, claims or attributes that GCP understands, right? So here, uh, we said that the GCP role claim in our identity token here should be mapped to the uh, role claim that the Google SDS understands, and this is this is key because this is how we we um, can you know define principles in GCP uh, that will be appropriately uh, scoped and with the appropriate permissions you know to do the things that we need to do. Right? So on that note, I can actually show you uh, a principle that I have already defined uh, you know in our internal uh, GCP organization here. Uh, and this is the this is what it looks like, right? It, it follows this convention, where where you know you, you find principal set, uh, blah 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 blah, the name of the workforce pool that's going to be in use, right? And as you can see here, attribute role, right? This is this is how we do the I guess the role based um, permissions, uh, and then this term is what's important. This term matches. Power user here, for instance, right? So anyone who provides uh, an identity token like this with um, GCP role attributes um, will have uh, the SCS will recognize this and 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 understand that you know anything, any principle with power user on the end here um, that the 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 access token that's provided will have the the permissions attached with that principle, right? In this case, it's browser and service usage admin. Right? All right, uh, so I've already set this all up. My workforce pool is in place. Um, I can go ahead and just do the, um, the get the identity token and do the exchange, right? So I can, let me demonstrate um, the, the scripts that I've written to do so. Um, This one here just makes a request to the identity provider that we have in our in my development environment to get uh, an identity token with this additional claim, right? So I'm just going to run that. Now I have an identity token, right? Um, This other script has a method that makes a call to the Google SCS token endpoint 
uh, takes the identity token that I just demonstrated and gives me back the access token that will allow me to do the things I need to do in GCP, right? Um, you know, this is all documented in your internal docs, you know, what it need, what this endpoint needs, you know, um, and, uh, but these are, these are the main things, you know, provided the identity token, you know, the project number and whatnot. So let me run this script. Provide it the identity token that I just generated using our internal identity provider, which has the the GCP role attribute already attached. And there I have, uh, and, and we can see that uh, the the, G, the Google SDS uh, provided me with an access token that I can now use to do the things I need to do. So let me see, um, let, let's first make sure that we're not authenticated here on this terminal to GCP. As you can see, I don't have any, um, any permissions here to do anything. And that can be further illustrated by trying to run this command. Oh wait, this worked because I already had uh, the what? environment variables. <laughs> wait, sorry about that. So let me unset this, right? And I get the error, right? equal to the new access token that we were just provided by GCP. Hit enter, and we exported that variable. Now, if we try to list projects, we see that we can. That's it, folks. Over to you, Stephen. Thanks very much, Adam. I hope you got value from that demo as much as I did. Uh, first of all, I just want to say, please go and have a look at the, this URL that's on your screen at the moment. Uh, if you want to get more information on the capabilities of this product, and reach out to your, your Google contact uh, if you would like to try that. Alan, I just want to thank you very much. Obviously, these sessions are always much more powerful when we have uh, the customer's voice. So really appreciate uh, you, you being participating today and the, the, valuable that you, the value that you gave us. And um, everybody else, I hope you have a great uh, next 22. Hi, I'm Shaquille O'Neal, and I'm the founder of Big Chicken. So you gotta do that at the end when you say Big Chicken. Big Chicken is Shaquille O'Neal's emerging fast casual restaurant chain that focuses on big fun, big flavor, and big food. When you're trying to build a national chain, communication is so critical. To do that, you need a great partner. And we're really lucky that partner is Google Workspace. You know, Josh, every time he does a presentation, he just loves Google Slides. As the person responsible for our marketing, probably the best at Google Slides. His presentations is like I'm at a movie sometimes. I'm just sitting there going. I've got some great new chicken sandwiches for you to try. Brand new recipes. <laughs> Isn't there something important we're supposed to be talking about? Good recipe development comes with collaboration. Using docs in Google Workspace gives us the tools we need to collaborate together. Shaquille's life gets crazy busy, as does our entire board. When you want to talk to me, make sure you put on my Google Calendar. Google Calendar is my girlfriend. I don't know anything I'm doing unless I talk to my woman. Google Workspace, productivity and collaboration tools for all the ways you work.
My name is Damith Kunaratni, and I'm a Group Product Manager at Google Cloud. And this is my colleague, Victor Salve, who is a Senior Product Manager at Google Cloud. Today, we'll be speaking to you about Google's new approach to software supply chain security. Before I dive into the details, I'd like to turn it over to Victor. He's going to take you through a quick overview on why software supply chain security is such a hot topic these days. Hey, thanks, Damith. Well, let's start with some background on software supply chains and why their security is top of mind these days. Now, most modern software products are typically made up of the source code your organization writes, um, as well as third-party software in the form of dependencies. Typically then a build process will combine these sources and output packaged software, which in turn can be run directly by your organization or consumed by other parties as their dependencies. So the dependencies can either be open source software or commercial off the shelf products. But in either case, the software will have its own set of contributors, its own SDLC process, and typically uh, its own set of third party dependencies. So as you can see, this constitutes a supply chain where you can be a supplier, a consumer, and oftentimes you're actually both. So this has the potential to leave your SDLC in a highly vulnerable state. You know, you're consuming software from a wide range of sources um, with largely unknown set of contributors, each with varying degrees of security in their own SDLC processes. And in fact, attacks on the software supply chain are increasing at an alarming rate. You know, Sonotype has noted a 650% surge in attacks year over year. Gartner predicts that by 2025, nearly half of the world's organizations will experience some form of supply chain attack. So at Google Cloud, we've identified a wide range of attack vectors across the SDLC. And I think while most organizations are focused on sort of the top priority obvious vectors like source code analysis and vulnerability scanning, uh, we're seeing real world threat actors you know, attacking across the entire spectrum here. And this includes things like compromising build systems um, and package repositories, as well as injection of compromised packages and a whole lot more. So the question is, what can we do to increase the security posture of our software development lifecycle? With this in mind, we're excited to introduce Google Cloud software supply chain security solution, Software Delivery Shield. Software Delivery Shield aims to provide a holistic solution to this problem, spanning the software development lifecycle, dependencies, and cloud runtime environments in which you operate your software. We've baked in a lot of Google's internal best practices into this solution, such as a trust-based policy system. And we understand that this is a journey we're all on together. So we've provided a stepwise implementation pathway rooted in the supply chain levels for software artifact standard, commonly referred to as Salsa. And each component of our solution can be used together or independently in combination with existing products you use in your software development process. Software Delivery Shield is aligned to the pillars of your software development lifecycle. Within Develop, we're shifting security left into the developer's local workstation and IDE. On the supply side, we're helping to improve the security posture of your dependencies. When it comes to CI/CD, we're helping to secure your build pipelines with out-of-the-box security capabilities for building both containers and non-container applications. And our container runtimes now provide security posture management for running workloads. Lastly, we utilize a trust-based policy engine to ensure only those images that meet your policies make it into your runtimes. Let's dig a bit deeper into all of this. Starting with develop, Cloud Workstations provides a fully managed development environment in the cloud, supporting popular IDEs like VS Code and IntelliJ. On top of this, Cloud Workstations comes with a number of built-in security features to help IT administrators and operators secure your development environments. Administrators are able to control private ingress and egress while using VPC security controls to prevent data exfiltration. This can help ensure your source code doesn't leave your organization's network perimeter. 
Cloud Workstations also provides force image updates and granular IAM access policies to make sure that developers are always using the latest secure development environments. Continuing with develop, Cloud Code Source Protect brings dependency vulnerability and license awareness directly into the IDE without blocking productivity. This all works seamlessly with Cloud Workstations. With Cloud Workstations and Cloud Code Source Protect, your IT administrators and developers can save hours in securely managing developer environments and creating secure applications. We're also providing new artifact management capabilities to help secure your dependencies. Artifact Registry now supports virtual and remote repositories, further strengthening dependency government and simplifying access points. On push vulnerability scanning in Artifact Registry with container analysis has been expanded to include support for Go and Maven containers. We also now support scanning of non containerized Maven packages. And now, a software bill of materials dependency list can also be generated for containerized applications, allowing you to gain a better understanding of third party dependencies. In addition to this, Assured Open Source Software provides a portfolio of over 250. Java and Python open source packages. These packages are built in our secured pipelines with software delivery shield products and are regularly scanned, analyzed, and fuzz tested for vulnerabilities. When it comes to building applications securely, Cloud Build has you covered by providing out of the box Salsa level three builds. In addition to already providing ephemeral and isolated build environments, Cloud Build now provides you with authenticated and non-falsifiable build provenance. This is available for containerized applications and Maven and Python packages, providing you with the ability to audit how your applications were built with zero configuration security guardrails in place. We're also introducing new security insights into Cloud Build through a new security insights panel. This will allow you to immediately understand the security posture of built artifacts. The Security Insights panel will display the Salsa level build, vulnerability, dependency, and build provenance information for the built artifacts. And once your applications are deployed to GKE or Cloud Run, additional security insights will be present right at the runtime. GKE provides continuous runtime vulnerability scanning for your workloads and also analyzes your Kubernetes configuration against the PodSpec security standards, highlighting deviances. And the Cloud Run built-in security panel has been enriched with Salsa build level, vulnerability, dependency, and build provenance information for your containers. Finally, binary authorization's trust-based policy system can be used to turn all these security insights into actionable policies. With trust-based policies, you can create attestations for specific processes that need to be followed or for tools that need to be used before applications can be permitted to run. These policies can then be applied and enforced on runtime such as GKE and Cloud Run. Now, Victor will show you how everything comes together. So let's look at how these components work together to improve your software supply chain security posture. We're gonna do a demo and we're gonna start in Cloud Workstations, wearing our developer hat. Cloud Code will warn us about vulnerabilities in our IDE. We'll then trigger a CI CD pipeline with Cloud Build creating the images with build provenance and displaying our Salsa level. We'll then use Artifact Registry and Container Analysis to store and automatically scan our images for vulnerabilities and also generate the SBOM. Next, we'll see how binary authorization policies gate our deployment to only trusted images. And then finally, we're gonna check out the new GKE security posture feature, uh, which shows us security concerns in the context of running workloads. Let's get started. Okay, let's start with the developer environments. Cloud Workstations provides customized developer environments that allows developers to get up and running quickly with just the pieces that they need uh, for a particular project. We can create custom profiles that can be set up within private networks. We can minimize data exfiltration risks, and we can customize the environment. So I can do things like select the CPU, RAM, and even GPU uh, profiles that I need. 
I can also do things like select the IDE that's going to run. I can also select a completely customized container image, and that would allow me to fully have control over all of the tools running within that. Um, we're going to be working in a Java environment, so I'm going to launch our Java dev profile here, which has all the tools I need, including the uh, Eclipse Temerin JDK. I also have Maven installed, so we're going to be working within a Maven project today. I also have Artifact Registry's new remote repositories configured. Now, this allows for proximal caching of my dependencies for speeding things up. And I've also got that configured, of course, within my POM XML to read from that registry. So I can get started with my Maven work. Let's shift gears and talk about dependencies. And let's talk about securing those dependencies against vulnerabilities. Cloud Code has a new capability called Source Protect. Now, Source Protect will provide linting style, as you can see, this kind of red underlining, uh, linting style notification of vulnerabilities that are lurking within the dependencies that you define. In this case, I'm again looking at a POM XML file. Um, I've got the Spring Boot framework here, and you can see all the various uh, vulnerabilities that are lurking within those dependencies. Now, if I update one of the versions here, one of the main versions, to something more current, you can quickly see that the count drops from 15 to 12 problems. And I can work through this POM XML and address all of these problems. Now, I'm not going to do that. I'm actually just going to go ahead and commit. And we're going to kick off a build within Cloud Build. Now, Cloud Build can be configured to run all those same tools that we just talked about. In this case, I've again, I've got my Maven uh, builders there. I've also got Docker. And uh, Docker is going to help me containerize my application and ultimately push to Artifact Registry the compiled image. Now, I've also configured a vulnerability scanning uh, policy. On push, I'm going to be scanning for vulnerabilities. Uh, what this policy does is it will fail the build if that policy has not been met, basically, if the thresholds are exceeded. In this case, you can see that it has. Now, we know that there was at least 12 problems still lurking there. And you can see that uh, in this case, Cloud Build caught those problems. Um, and we were able to stop the build without proceeding down toward a, a deployment. Now, we could take a look at the actual image that was produced. And this is stored and housed in Artifact Registry. Artifact Registry provided that vulnerability scanning, basically. Um, on push, it automatically scans. And you can see that, in fact, aside from the, the eight mediums, I have quite a few highs and criticals lurking here, both Maven and OS level uh, vulnerabilities. So my vulnerability policy stops CICD from deploying this image. But what if I tried to deploy it directly with kubectl, so short circuiting the CICD process? Now I'm going to do that, and I'm going to try, but you'll see that it actually fails. And the reason uh, my deployment fails is because I have a admission control policy set up that blocks any image that has not accumulated proper trust. Now this is done by a system called binary authorization. And binary authorization can be configured to uh, set out a policy where you, you can specify all the trust factors required. In this case, I only have two. I have that it be built by Cloud Build is one, and that we have a vulnerability scan uh, as, as the second. So as a result, I'm going to have to just go through and fix all of the problems uh, within this particular uh, application. Um, so I'm going to use uh, Cloud Code here to help me do that. As you can see that Cloud Code will help me find not just the direct dependencies, but also ones like this, which is a transitive dependency. And uh, that would be very challenging to find otherwise. So let's fast forward a bit. We've fixed all those problems. And now we can kick off another uh, another build by triggering it via via push. And we'll do that now. And we'll see that once this thing finishes, it actually passed and we were able to get through that vulnerability uh, policy step and on toward a CD uh, via cloud deploy. We can also take a look at a new capability called Security Insights within Cloud Build. This provides information such as the salsa level that we attained, um, the build integrity of this particular item. So we can see that there's no vulnerabilities lurking here. We can also inspect all of the, uh, the dependencies that are in this particular image. 
we can also look at the provenance of this image. Now, provenance uh, is, think of it as the recipe. So this is all of the inputs, including all the build steps, um, including the builders that were used, like Maven in this case, and Docker. We can also see things like the fact that we went through that vulnerability uh, policy step. My application has been deployed. It's running in GKE. Now let's take a look at the security posture a little more closely using the new security posture management capability within GKE. Now this provides an analysis of my running workloads on the various clusters I have. In this case, I have three clusters. I have 13 running workloads. Um, and it looks at things like configuration concerns. Now these are pod spec considerations. Also, of course, vulnerabilities. So this is a, a daily scan of OS vulnerabilities that comes with GKE. So I have a drill down interface where I can slice by various perspectives like concern or namespace workload. I can also do things like filter by severity. So in this case, I'm gonna prioritize my time and focus on the most important things. In this case, I have a, you know, a high CVSS score uh, vulnerability with a fix uh, in at hand so I can go ahead and remediate. I also know where to remediate. And this is one of the great things about security posture management in GKE. It ties together not just the problems, but it pulls them in to the context of where it is, where in your workloads these things reside. Let's take a look at our application, the Maven application we just deployed. And we can go and filter for that particular cluster. And I can see my demo app application. And I can see that there are actually two suggestions, some medium level suggestions. One is that we're running as root. The other problem here is that my pod security spec actually allows for privilege escalation. Armed with where it is and how to fix it, I can just update the YAML and make the changes to secure this particular workload. So that was our demo. We saw how Google Cloud's developer tools, build platform, artifact management, and our trust-based policy engine work together to secure your software development lifecycle. While GKE now provides built-in security posture awareness and remediation. Thanks for the great demo, Victor. All of these features are available in preview and you can get started with our quick start tutorials to learn more about software supply chain security and how to secure your software development lifecycle, take a look at our software supply chain security site. And don't forget to check out some of our other sessions on cloud workstations, simplifying the building of modern apps, CICD, GKE, and Anthos. Thanks for tuning in and learning about how Google Cloud is looking to secure your software supply chain. Enjoy the rest of Google Cloud Next.